Carol said, Nipa Dia, would you please lead us in the pledge? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. This evening, Council's uh, grateful to have Pastor Timothy Liggins of Bethel AME Church to pray with us. Pastor, welcome back to Council. Commissioner. Thank you. Good evening to everyone. Let us pray. Eternal God, our Heavenly Father, we come to you in prayer, first thanking you for the love, for your love and your mercies. We thank you for the love that you have for the residents of this great city. And we thank you for these civil servants <clears throat> who have responded to the call that you have placed in their hearts. We thank you for how you have orchestrated it for them to be in the position they are in for such a time as this. Oh God, there are many challenges that stand before us, but that is why we look to you first. For every problem has a solution, and you are able to divinely lead and guide into all wisdom. Oh God, our faith tells us that nothing is too hard for you. It tells us that you are able to work all things together for good, and it tells us that you know the plans that you have for the residents of this city, plans for our good and not for evil. So God, bless this meeting. Father, bless these, your servants. Grant them divine wisdom, guidance, and courage. Give them a heart that is after your heart, that they too will want to do justice and love mercy. And bless all who will take part this evening. Let love and patience rule in these proceedings. We are believing for great outcomes for this city by way of this meeting. And Lord, for all of your blessings and all of your grace, we are careful to give your name all the glory and all the praise. In the matchless name of our Lord and Savior, we pray. Let everyone say amen. 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 Thank you, Pastor. Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Barossa de Padilla, Doran's favor, Remy, President Harden. Any person who takes any action to obstruct or interfere with the conduct of tonight's meeting may be charged with disturbing a lawful meeting pursuant to Columbus City Code 2317.12. Any person who enters those areas of city council chambers reserved for city officials or invited guests may be charged with criminal trespass pursuant to Columbus City Code 2311.21. Can I get a motion to dispense with the reading of the journal? Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Barossa de Padilla, Dorrance, Favor, Remy, President Harden. Are there any additions or corrections to the journal? Hearing none, the journal is approved. This week's communications received by the city clerk's office are listed on the agenda and will be published in the city bulletin. Are there any other communications to be read into the record? None received. Thank you. We will now go around the dais for um, resolutions or updates from council members, starting with council member Bankston. Thank you. Council member Barossa de Padilla. Thank you. Um, I just we want to thank folks who came out. It was a busy week last week for the first immigrant migrant refugee town hall and also for uh, the pay equity workshop. We had a great turnout at both. I just want folks to mark their calendars for April 19th. That is a, I thought I had it in my notes and I don't, give me one second. That is a Wednesday. Um, we'll be having our second immigrant migrant refugee town hall. We are calling them Immigrants Make Columbus. And you can find out more information and um, RSVP at immigrantsmakecolumbus.com. Dot com. That's all for me this evening. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember. Uh, Councilmember Dorrance. Councilmember Favor. Thank you, Council President Harden. The month of April is Second Chance Month. In the United States, one in three American adults has a criminal record, which limits their access to education, jobs, housing, among other things necessary for a productive life. Even after they have completed their sentences and have been released from prison, these men and women face more than 44,000 documented legal restrictions in, in addition to widespread social stigma. This is sometimes called the second prison. This all occurs against the backdrop of the criminal justice system's stark racial imbalances. People of color, particularly black Americans, are disproportionately represented at every stage of the U.S. criminal justice system from arrest to reintegration. Now more than ever, it is crucial that we raise awareness about the challenges men and women face upon re-entry as they seek health care, housing, and employment. Second Chance Month, spearheaded by the Prison Fellowship in 2017, aims to raise awareness and improve perceptions of people with a criminal record 
encourage second chance opportunities, and drive momentum for policy change throughout the country. Myself and my colleagues here on Columbus City Council remain committed to helping justice-involved residents lead successful lives through innovative ideas such as Opportunity Port, supporting local organizations, working with returning citizens, and more. We continue to learn and pass progressive policies to support all Columbus residents. This month, I encourage you to engage in conversation, learn, and participate in ways to support returning citizens in our community. Additionally, the last week of April, and the last week of April, our community will celebrate National Reentry Week. This week will provide an opportunity to reflect on and educate Columbus on the importance of equitable, restorative reentry practices and the need for smart justice measures at all parts of the cr criminal justice continuum. This year, Central Ohio's reentry partners will host a variety of events, including professional development webinars, a community resource fair, a multidisciplinary art exhibition, and advocacy training at the State House for community members with lived experience, and a community-wide event featuring internationally acclaimed author and anti-violence expert, Danielle Sarid. Details for these events will be highlighted on Council's social media channels, and those interested in learning more can visit www.centralohioreentryweek.com. I now have the honor of presenting Resolution 0043X-2023 to designate April 2023 as National Fair Housing Month within the City of Columbus. I'd now like to invite Melissa Benson with Columbus Legal Aid to the podium. National Fair Housing Month celebrates the passage of the Fair Housing Act of 1968. The Fair Housing Act was created to put an end to inequities within the housing system and eliminate racial segregation in American neighborhoods. Historical legacies of discriminatory housing policies are still evident within Ohio, with 33% and 31% of black and Hispanic renters respectively experiencing severe housing problems compared to only 23% of white renters. The City of Columbus aims to increase awareness of fair housing issues, eliminate intolerance and biased behavior among individuals and groups working within the housing space. As chair of City Council's Housing Committee, I am proud to have passed the Housing for All legislative package, which included source of income discrimination, renter's choice security deposit, and rental's receipt to protect our tenants' rights. Earlier this month, we also shared Council's 2023 housing initiatives, where we will dig deeper and pass more policies to protect residents and promote fair housing. City Council remains committed to securing equal opportunity for all, as well as providing encouragement to those whose housing needs have yet to be realized. Melissa Benson, I'll turn the podium over to you now. Thank you, Council Member Favor, and thank you to all of City Council for inviting me to be here today as you recognize April is Fair Housing Month. All of the residents of the state of Ohio and the city of Columbus are protected by fair housing law and deserve to rent, purchase, and finance their housing free of discrimination on the basis of race, color, religion, national origin, sex, familial status, disability, and military status. Further, in the city of Columbus, additional protections are recognized on the basis of sexual orientation, gender identity or expression, age, and source of income. Through our partnership with the city of Columbus, LASC works to enforce fair housing rights for residents of the area. Through our work with the Department of Housing and Urban Development, we enforce those rights throughout the region. In the past year, we have assisted more than 100 Columbus residents facing housing discrimination. This is just the tip of the iceberg. We have filed complaints on behalf of Columbus residents with the Ohio Civil Rights Commission for fair housing violations, including race and disability discrimination and sexual harassment by landlords. We have raised fair housing violations in defense of eviction actions and proposed subsidy terminations, ensuring that Columbus tenants do not lose their homes due to discrimination. We have obtained numerous reasonable accommodations uh, for disabled Columbus residents so that they may fully use and enjoy their rental housing. And most recently, we were pleased to partner with the City of Columbus to preserve the housing voucher, to preserve the housing for 61 voucher holder tenants at a north side complex when their landlord sent them a notice that their vouchers would no longer be accepted in violation of the city's source of income discrimination ordinance. Among these tenants were veterans, senior citizens, people with disabilities, and immigrants. Many had lived in the complex without issue for over a decade before being told that their vouchers would no longer be accepted. 
One resident, a 68-year-old Army veteran, told the Columbus Dispatch, I'm so frustrated right now, I just don't understand where they get the idea that they can do this and they don't have to answer to the law. Thanks to our partnership with the City of Columbus to enforce fair housing laws, we were able to advocate for these tenants with the City Attorney's Office and hold the complex accountable to the law. The City responded quickly, sending a letter to the complex, which prompted the withdrawal of the notice, preserving the tenancies of 61 vulnerable Columbus residents who were asked to move out simply because part of their income came from Section 8. We look forward to continuing to partner with the city to create a robust enforcement mechanism for source of income discrimination and the other protections guaranteed under fair housing law and the Housing for All legislative package. We will continue to expand our fair housing work, help to educate the community about fair housing rights, and we'll create a testing program to better protect all Columbus residents from discrimination in housing. In today's housing market, the most vulnerable Columbus residents, racial and ethnic minorities, single mothers, people with disabilities, immigrants, they face many, many challenges in finding safe, stable housing. Discrimination should not be among them. We must work to enforce the fair housing protections that exist in our city in order to create a stronger, more diverse, and more stable Columbus for all who live here. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Ms. Benson. And we truly do appreciate uh, the work and the advocacy and partnership uh, that comes from the Legal Aid uh, Society of Columbus. Uh, you all continue to do great work. Uh, we're ex incredibly excited to have um, now extended our partnership to include this fair housing um, element. And you know the reality is that we can pass all of the uh, progressive housing policies that we want to, but if there are not measures in place to ensure uh, that individuals that are experiencing discrimination have a way to report those, um, uh, those uh, instances and then those instances be investigated, uh, then this makes all of the work for naught, right? Uh, so thank you for the work that you all continue to do. Are there any uh, questions or comments by my colleagues? Seeing none, I'd move for adoption. Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Barossa de Padilla, Doran's favor, Remy, President Harden. Thank you. <laughs> All right, next I have uh, resolution 0056X-2023 to designate April 10th through the 14th, 2023, as National Community Development Week in the City of Columbus. The City of Columbus is a participant in the Community Development Block Grant, or CDBG, Home Investment Partnerships, Emergency Solutions Grant, and Housing Opportunities for Persons with AIDS programs. These critical community development programs provide funds from the Department of Housing and Urban Development for public infrastructure, economic development, and housing programs in our community. Through this partnership, Columbus has dedicated resources to secure housing or shelter for our most vulnerable populations, including low to moderate income and those experiencing homelessness. During the week of April 10th through the 14th, we observe National Community Development Week to give special recognition to all participants whose hard work and devotion to the neighborhoods and their residents help ensure the quality and effectiveness of the community development programs. Uh, with that, I'd like to hand it over to Director Stevens to provide some additional remarks. Uh, thank you, President Hardin, Chair Favor, members of council. I'd actually like to introduce my colleague, Rita Paris, who is our Housing Division Administrator, who runs these programs and give us a little more insight on the importance of community development and uh, what we'll be recognizing that week. So I will hand it over to Rita, who I can hear coming up now. Good evening, President Harden and Chair Favor. Um, while we recognize the work that we do, sometimes it feels like it's never done, and we recognize that there is a lot more to accomplish. We are going to take an opportunity for Community Development Week to take a breather and pat ourselves on the back a little bit for the good work that we've done. We thank the mayor and city council for the tremendous support that we have had in accomplishing many goals with many more yet to come. Um, we are actually doing um, an event on the 13th where we are going to be inviting elected officials to join us to have discussion around the whole affordable housing realm and the work that goes into it and the housing strategy and also do a tour of some of our multifamily projects in the Franklinton neighborhood. Uh, we're really excited about this. Um, clearly, all council members have been invited. We would love to see you join us and or your aides if they can. 
Um, but it is going to be a great week for us to actually celebrate a little bit for the work that we've done and be thankful for the great team that we have to, to get us there. Thank you so much, Ms. Paris. Uh, Ms. Paris or Director Stevens, if uh, folks want to learn a little bit more about Community Development Week, uh, is there a place for them to go? Director? Uh, yeah, if you go to columbus.gov uh, forward slash development, we have information on the week there. Wonderful. Any questions or comments by my colleagues? Yes. Councilmember Bankston. No, I just wanted to just reiterate how great a, a week this is to um, to celebrate. Um, you know, often when we think about development, we think about the bricks and sticks of the work, right, which is the easy part that we can see. Uh, but community development really centers people uh, in our mm -hmm. families. Uh, and so it's messier. <laughs> it's harder to explain sometimes and a little bit wonkier. Um, but it is the transformation that you see in places like Franklin and mm -hmm. Hilltop, the one lending community plan that come to life when uh, community uh, and government and private sector stack hands and say that we want to make a change in our neighborhood. So thank you, um, uh, Deputy I mean, Director, and thank you to our housing administrator for all the work that you've done through the years in helping to transform our neighborhoods uh, and the lives of so many people. So thank you and congratulations. Thank you, Council Member, and he's absolutely correct. This work does center people, uh, so we appreciate the work that the department does uh, to help support um, our, our various partners across the, the, the city uh, that are doing great work to serve our residents. Uh, with that, I'd move for adoption. Second. Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Barossa de Padilla, Dorn's favor, Remy, President Hardin. Adopt. Adopted. got to get 10,000 steps today, so this is helping me out. Uh, and last but certainly not least, uh, Council President Harden, with your permission, I have one resolution I'd like to introduce from the floor. Uh, at this time, I'd like to inv invite uh, Dorian Wingard and Jessica Roach to come forward to the podium to introduce resolution 0061X-2023 to designate April 11th through April 17th as Black Maternal Health Week in the city of Columbus and recognize restoring our own through transformation for their ongoing efforts to raise awareness for black maternal and infant health. The U.S. has the highest maternal mortality rates in the developed world with 32.9 deaths per 100,000 live births in 2021. And this number is even more shocking for black women. In 2021, the maternal mortality rate for black women was 69.9 deaths per 100,000 live births, 2.6 times the rate for non-Hispanic white women. This phenomenon has numerous root causes, including gaps in health care, social determinants of health, economic disparities, and racism, as evidenced by the fact that black women are disproportionately more likely to suffer from perinatal mood and anxiety disorders like postpartum depression without access to the healthcare resources necessary to address it. Further, gaps in access to basic reproductive health care like STI screenings and abortion, contraception access and counseling leaves black women at higher risk for health implications from pregnancy. And a cornerstone of any plan to address these inequities involves recognizing black-led doula and midwifery care as a sound, evidence-based form of health care for black women and birthing people, providing life-saving services and reducing the mortality rates among these vulnerable populations. Black Maternal Health Week is celebrated annually to uplift the voices of black women and birthing people through advocacy efforts to ensure they retain their fundamental right to bodily autonomy and safety. Restoring Our Own Through Transformation is a Columbus-based organization led by black women who are dedicated to raising awareness for black maternal and infant health through doula services and training, research, education, and consultation. With that, I'd now like to turn uh, the podium over to Ms. Roach and Mr. Wingard to say a few words on this resolution. Thank you so much, Council Member Favor. We really appreciate that. Council President Hardin. Council members, thank you for having us today. We appreciate the acknowledgement of Black Maternal Health Week 2023. 
My name is Jessica Roach, and I'm the Chief Executive Officer of Restoring Our Own Through Transformation. And this is my partner and COO, Dorian Wingard. Root provides comprehensive, full-spectrum perinatal support doula services. That draws a distinction in that, because we are there with the family, through family planning, throughout the entire prenatal period, through labor and delivery, and through extended postpartum. We're there for all aspects of the black family in order to make sure we can create healthy environments. Root also engages on a national level public health policy, advocacy, research, and education of interdisciplinary professionals because we know that it is important and is necessary in order to be able to change the spectrum of care how, as it, to how it impacts us as black families. Black Maternal Health Week was created six years ago by the Black Mamas Matter Alliance to raise awareness around the black maternal health crisis in this country. Root, as the first kindred partner of the Black Mamas Matter Alliance, has utilized our platform and the shared responsibility in the relationship that we have developed with the Black Mamas Matter Alliance over these years to elevate the message and care of black mothers, black fathers, and black children. The black maternal mortality rate nationally has increased significantly over the last few years. Specifically from 2019 to 2021, Council uh, Member Favor quoted those um, stats for us. We've seen a 40% increase in black maternal mortality over these last few years. And despite the abysmal rates that we see even reflected in our own city, Root as an organization has maintained a 0% black maternal and infant mortality since its inception in 2017. Root understands the key to having healthy black infants is to ensure the health and well-being of the black family. The black maternal mortality and morbidity rate is intricately tied to our birth outcomes. So it is no surprise that our black infant mortality rates continue to rise. Both are caused by medical misinformation, neglect, obstetric and systemic racism. There is no biological or genetic basis for our health outcomes. Black race is not a behavioral health risk. Obstetric racism is. The mortality rate of our infants and families is utilized nationally as a public health indicator. Therefore, it is a reflection of our city. And while the mayors discussed in the state of the city address infant vitality, we still as a city have failed to address the infant mortality issue that we have. While this resolution recognizing Black Maternal Health Week is sincerely appreciated, and in particular, council members Bankston and Favor for championing, championing the work that we do at Root, it must be understood that it will take more than a week of awareness to be able to address and ensure the safety and well being of black families. True health equity will only be achieved by supporting the community-based organizations that have proven their, effect, their efficacy in these initiatives. We thank you very much for your time, and we appreciate the acknowledgement. Absolutely. Thank you so much for the work that you yeah. all do every single day. Um, this is, I know, a labor of love. See that pun I did, that labor, yeah, we heard birthing? That. Y'all got it. Uh, it. It's truly a labor of love, uh, and I mean this uh, with all sincerity. Uh, you all truly meet the family uh, where they're at, and it is individualized care. Uh, you have a model that works, and we are incredibly grateful uh, for the work that you continue to do uh, in, in meeting uh, parents, families, loved ones where they're at. Um, this is going to take a lot of work for us to chip away at these numbers, and they have only gone up uh, for 2022 slash 2023. 
And so it is time for us to get loud uh, and aggressive uh, as we can to tackle uh, this this problem at hand. Um, I know Councilmember Bankston probably has something he'd like to say as well. Um, well, first off, uh, to Dorian and Jessica, thank you for all you do in this community. Uh, you all said it best and, and said it well. Uh, I know me and you have had lengthy conversations about this, and it is about, yes, saving our black babies, but we also have to save our black mamas. Um, and in order to do that, we're going to continue to raise awareness. Um, but it is my hope that one day in our lifetime, uh, we will celebrate this week, not as a week of awareness, but as a week of triumph. Mm -hmm. Triumph over systemic racism and systemic issues that have plagued our country and our city for way too long, uh, particularly in the healthcare sector, mm -hmm. uh, because this is an issue that is urgent. Uh, it is a matter that it is literally life or death. Yep. Uh, and I've seen the work that you all have done firsthand, uh, and that is what makes the difference. Uh, not only being with someone through the health aspects of their pregnancy, but empowering women and empowering families to be able to stand up and know what is happening in those uh, doctor's offices and in uh, the birthing process, having a plan in place, that's what truly makes the difference. And that's what you're doing every single day. Uh, we can't do it at scale just yet, but we're working on it. Uh, and so in the meantime, thank you for what you're continuing to do. Thank you for yeah. continuing to be an advocate uh, and an activist in this space. Uh, and we celebrate this week, unfortunately, for what it is for, but we want to continue to raise awareness. And, and we're celebrating ahead of time because we don't have a council meeting next week, but we want to make sure that folks know that it's coming uh, down the pipeline and so that they can get prepared uh, and attend events uh, accordingly. Uh, Councilmember Remy? Okay. Anyone, any other council members have any thoughts at this time? Yes, I, just, I just wanted to echo our council members and just say thank you. I think um, I'm... Uh, Doulas, my children aren't even that old, but doulas were not something that was commonplace. And I remember looking, looking very hard to try to find a doula and try to find a culturally competent doula was even harder. And so I went without that at a time where it was incredibly scary and when you have complications and having someone who can truly be an advocate for you and for your family um, is life-changing, literally. And so I just wanted to acknowledge and thank you for your work and thank you for elevating this for all of us because I think every time we do a month or a week, it's never about that time. It's about amplifying and raising the volume, but it's an ongoing effort 365 days of the year, so yeah. thank you. Absolutely, spot on. Uh, if folks want to learn more about Black Maternal Health Week, where can they go? They can go to our website at www.root, with two T's, rj.org. And they can also check out our Instagram page and our Twitter page, which is also at root, two T's, rj. And then our Facebook page is actually just root by itself. Um, and that, again, is with two T's. And if I could just have a moment and say thank you again for, mm -hmm. for your comments and, and for the support. It is very obvious for us in the way in which we have our model and being clear about how it is that we need to address black families, that that is a consistent theme in the success of being able to make sure that we are addressing the black maternal mortality and infant mortality rate. And so it is incredibly important for us to be very focused in a health equity way to make sure that our families are at the center and that everyone in that family is honored in that process. Thank you so much. Uh, with that, I'd move for adoption. Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Barossa de Padilla, Dorrance, Favor, Remy, President Harden. Adopted. I believe that is all for me, Council President. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember. Uh, Councilmember Remy. Thank you very much, Council President. I have one announcement, one resolution this evening. This past <laughs> Saturday, I hosted the second annual Cleaner Columbus Citywide Cleanup, and we had a wonderful time with the weather before it got to be 60 mile an hour winds that turned it turned out to be a great day though to pick up litter and our preliminary numbers continue to grow but as of five o'clock today we had 338 volunteers pick up in 48 40 areas of town that's almost 680 hours of volunteer time 
There were 802 bags of litter. That's over 12,313 pounds of litter out of our neighborhood. So congratulations to our city for a day's worth of effort. And it was just a, a good opportunity as I drove through town seeing people throughout every intersection. There were people in yellow vests. It was really great. So thank you to everyone who came out for this day of action to kick off Earth Month. If you want to join in on the action this month, you can reach out to Keep Columbus Beautiful or Green Columbus for more information. So speaking of Earth Month, I'd also like to invite our guests from Keep Columbus Beautiful and Swaco up, Ari Alex and Joe Lombardi, to the podium as I introduce Resolution 50X 2023 to recognize April 10th through the 16th, 2023 as Food Waste Prevention Week in the city of Columbus. It is estimated that as much as 40% of the food supply in the United States goes uneaten and almost 95% of wasted food is disposed in landfills or in incinerators where it represents the largest component of disposed municipal solid waste. Food waste disposed of in landfills emits methane, a potent greenhouse gas that contributes to climate change. The natural resources used to produce food, such as energy, land, and water, also are wasted when food is thrown away. We know that 13% of Columbus adults and children are food insecure and therefore do not have a reliable source of food to support a healthy and active lifestyle. In fact, the average American family wastes an average of approximately $1,800 worth of food per year. The City of Columbus's Climate Action Plan has a goal of reducing 95% of organic material going to the landfill by 2050. The Columbus and Franklin County Local Food Action Plan identifies the prevention of food-related waste through increased consumer education, household composting, technical assistance to food businesses, and regulatory <laughs> updates that support food waste diversion. Reducing the amount of food going to waste and diverting it from disposal mitigates climate change, conserves natural resources, feeds hungry Columbus residents, saves money, and produces beneficial products such as soil amendment and energy. Now, therefore, be it resolved by the City Council of the City of Columbus that this council does hereby declare its commitment to reducing food waste as part of the city's climate action plan and recognizes the week of April 10th through the 16th, 2023, as Food Waste Prevention Week in the City of Columbus, Ohio. Thank you so much, and I'm excited to have Ari Alex, Sustainability Manager and Keep Columbus Beautiful Executive Director, and Joe Lombardi, the Executive Director of Solid Waste Authority of Central Ohio, to speak on this re resolution. Ari, Joe, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, good evening, President Harden, uh, President Pro Tem Dorans, uh, Chair Remy, and Council members. Thank you for this opportunity to speak about Food Waste Prevention Week that begins next Monday, April 10th. My name is Ari Alex, and I have the privilege of working on our city's food waste efforts with the Department of Public Service and Division of Refuse Collection. Reducing food waste has the power to feed people rather than landfills, save money, and conserve resources. Our goal is to raise awareness and inspire people to reduce food waste in their homes, workplaces, and communities. Up to 40% of food in the United States is wasted, contributing to extensive, extensive environmental, economic, and societal impacts. There's an estimated 51,000 tons of edible food from our city's waste stream that goes to the landfill every year. By reducing the amount of food that is thrown out, Columbus can make progress towards climate and sustainability goals. By rescuing surplus food, we can address food gaps in our communities. The city of Columbus has an aggressive yet achievable goal of carbon neutrality by 2050 with our city's climate action plan. To achieve that goal, we must have a 90% reduction in organic waste that goes to our landfill. When reached, this will result in saving over 133,000 metric tons of greenhouse gas emissions and make a significant contribution towards our climate goals. To help meet those goals, the city has developed a partnership with Swaco's Save More Than Food campaign that will educate residents how to reduce, rescue, and recycle food to save resources and ensure healthier communities. I'm also excited to highlight that with grant funding from Swaco, Columbus will launch its first ever food waste pilot program this year. Residents will be able to collect and drop off their food waste at five different sites at two new waste and reuse convenience centers and three food waste drop-off sites at recreation centers in our city. We are excited to launch this program later this year and more details will follow. 
Thank you so much for your time and continued support of these efforts. And I will hand it over to my friend and partner, Joe Lombardi from Swaco. Thanks, Ari. President Hardin, Councilmember Remy, and other members of council, it's great to be back in this chamber to discuss a very important issue of our region. I am pleased that Columbus City Council is recognizing Food Waste Prevention Week with this resolution. I'm joined this evening by Scott Perry, Assistant Executive Director, and Jane Bohm, Food Waste Programs Administrator for Swaco. Most of us have probably are familiar with the national statistics about the amount of food being wasted in America. But food waste isn't something just happening in other communities. Wasted food is the single largest source of landfill material in central Ohio. In fact, the county landfill receives nearly a million pounds of food waste each day, while in our community, one out of five residents are at risk of food insecurity. There is also an economic impact as millions of dollars are lost every year due to food waste. Those are sobering statistics when you consider all the impacts throwing away the food from our dinner plates has on our environment, our community, and our economy. To address this issue, Swaco and the Central Ohio Food Waste Initiative launched an awareness campaign regarding the impact of food waste known as Save More Than Food. While there is no single solution to solve this complex issue, but as we have recently shared with NBC Nightly News and has been reported by the New York Times, Swaco is working with many partners to tackle this issue on several fronts. As Swaco's largest customer and with a population that continues to grow in central Ohio, we must all work together to ensure Columbus's activities will have a big impact on our regional efforts to become more sustainable. We applaud the thoughtfulness of the Columbus Climate Action Plan and the bold initiatives by the administration and Columbus City Council toward addressing climate change, which will undoubtedly benefit all of us. As your regional partner, Swaco can help. We appreciate our partnership with the City of Columbus and look forward to building up on our many efforts together to enhance recycling, including capturing more hard to recycle materials at convenience centers, as well as creating opportunities to divert food waste from the landfill through a new grant program, as already talked about with Columbus Recreation and Parks. Only by working together will, be, will we be able to take care of our environment and enhance the quality of life in our community. For more information about the Save More Than Food program, please visit savemorethanfood.org. Thank you again for this resolution and the opportunity to speak in support of it. Thank you very much for your ongoing efforts in raising awareness for this important issue. It's it's critical that we do something to, s to start making an impact, and I'm looking forward to having and promoting these uh, food waste drop-off centers, which will be so integral in our work towards the Climate Action Plan. So thank you again. I move for adoption. Okay. Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Barosa de Padilla, Doran's favor, Remy, President Hardin. Adopted. <laughs> And that is all I have this evening. Thank you, Councilmember Remy. Are there any comments by other elected official city attorneys, city auditor, city treasurer's office? Uh, seeing none, at this time I request the following ordinance to be removed from the consent portion of the agenda. We have Techno Technology Ordinance 0887-2023, Public Service and Transportation uh, Ordinance 0760-2023, Housing Ordinance 0917-2023, Health and Human Service Ordinances 0759-2023, 0866-2023, and 1021-2023. Are there any other requests by members of council for the removal of an ordinance on the, or, uh, on the consent portion of the agenda? Hearing none, may we now have a motion to waive reading of titles of third-day legislation. Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Barosa de Padilla, Dorrance, Favor, Remy, President Hardin. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Will the clerk now read into the record orders the number of 30 day legislation on tonight's agenda? Technology Committee, Ordinance 729, Ordinance 807, 904 2023, Public Service and Transportation, 
Resolution 42X 2023, ordinances 423, 688, 863, 874, 937 2023. Recreation and Parks, ordinance 755 2023. Public Utilities, Ordinance 551, 564, 599, 691, 697, 744, 745, 761, 797, 826, 957-2023 Building and Zoning Policy Ordinance 0870-2023 Housing Ordinance 784 871-947-2023 Public Safety Ordinance 121-2023 Environment Committee Ordinance 873-2023 Administration 846 and 928-2023 Finance Committee Ordinance 802-822-953-955-2023. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Uh, the following ordinance appear on our agenda as considered actions with the clerk read those into the record. Resolution 49X, 52X, 55X, 47X, 45X, 53X, and 54X-2023. Economic Development, Resolution 46X-2023, Ordinance 792, 794, 795, 796, 800, 803, 804, 806, 808, and 974-2023. Public Service and Transportation, Ordinance 653-2023. 686, 689, 742, 743, 793, 799, 816 2023. Neighborhoods and Immigrant, Refugee, and Migrant Affairs, Ordinance 912 2023. Recreation and Parks, Ordinance 98, 434, 435, 437, 441, 751, 757, and 938 2023. Public Utilities, Ordinance 726, 764, and 801 2023. Housing Committee, Ordinance 823, 864, 930 2023. Criminal Justice and Judiciary, Ordinance 769, 770, 771, and 778 2023, or 788 2023. Uh, Health and Human Services, Ordinance 715, 829, 857. 2023 public safety ordinance 382 705 uh, 737 790 798 837 860 and 953 2023 environment committee ordinance 964 2023 administration ordinance 694 695 696 and 776 2023 Finance Committee, Ordinance 3237 2022, Ordinance 675, 682, 692, 781, 845, and 867 2023. Appointments from the Mayor, uh, A103, A104, A105, A106, and A107 2023. Thank you, Madam Clerk. We have one speaker on the consent portion of the agenda. Uh, Felina, uh, Felina Farley is on WebEx. Felina Farley? Yes. All right, welcome to council. If you would um, uh, state your name and if you represent an organization and you'll have three minutes to speak, it looks like you're speaking on uh, ordinance 0953 in public safety. Welcome to council. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, hello, I'm Felina Farley, uh, the National Black Caucus uh, Media Co-Chair of the Green Party. And um, I'm here to talk about uh, police accountability and reflect on the media biases of injustices and black, and black issues. Um, so we call for an end to police brutality, immunity and abuse of power. Over the past few decades, there has been numerous videotaped excessive force crimes against and killings of black Americans, 
at the hands of white officers or other law enforcement. Um, and we do endorse a proposed congressional resolution that calls for the end to racial disparities in the application of US police practices and shift towards public safety and security that is community oriented. Um, it is necessary that a just society recognizes that all people have equal access to resources. Police need to be held accountable to end racism. Community-based policing ensures that law enforcement agencies reflect the racial makeup of their communities and are demo democratically controlled. And we need to see these changes. We need to see an accountability model that eliminates the ability of police unions to defend officers accused of misconduct. And that is essential to finally putting an end to the killing of unarmed black men, women, and children by police. So I, we do endorse this community police patrol as long as it also includes patrolling the police. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Ms. Farley. Are there any comments or questions for uh, Ms. Farley? All right. Thank you for being with us at council. Are there any other questions or comments about the consent portion of the agenda? Hearing none, may I have a motion for approval of these items? So I please call the roll by voice. No, just by call the roll then. Bankston, Barosa de Padilla, Dorrance, Favor, Remy, President Harden. Passed. Uh, we will now proceed with the second reading of 30 day postponed and emergency legislation. The first committee to come before council is the Technology Committee, chaired by Councilmember Bankston. Councilmember, the floor is yours. Thank you, uh, President Harden. <clears throat> we have one item on uh, second read in the Technology Committee. It's ordinance 0887 2023, found on page 11 in our agenda, to authorize the Director of the Department of Technology to enter into an agreement with Ornet slash OSU for VMware software licensing, maintenance, and support uh, pursuant to Columbus City Code sections relating to non-for-profit service contracts to authorize the expenditure of $406,689.34 from the Department of Technology Information Services Operating Fund and to declare an emergency. Uh, I move to postpone this ordinance until the April 24th meeting. Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston? Yes. Barossa de Padilla? Yes. Dorans? Yes. Favor? Yes. Remy? Yes. President Harden? Yes, ordinance is postponed. Thank you. That's all I have in the, my committees this evening. All right. Next committee coming for council is the Public Service Transportation Committee, chaired by Council Member uh, Lourdes Barossa de Padilla. Council Member Flores Joris. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Ordinance 0932-2023 to authorize the Finance and Management Director to establish purchase orders and contracts with multiple vendors for the purchase of various traffic management and control commodities for the Department of Public Service to author the, authorize the expenditure of up to $1,600,000 from the street, construction, maintenance, and repair fund for the purchase of various traffic management and control commodities and to declare an emergency. The Department of Public Service, sorry. Uh, utilizes pavement marking materials, sign manufacturing materials, school, fla school flashers, traffic signal commodities, and a variety of traffic management and control commodities throughout the city. These supplies and materials are necessary to ensure traffic safety throughout the city of Columbus. Do any of my colleagues have questions or comments? Great, seeing none, I move for passage. Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Barossa de Padilla, Dorrance, Favor, Remy, President Harden. Passed. Thank you. And if we could go back to the consent agenda, page 12, 
uh, Ordinance 0760-2023 to authorize the transfer of appropriation with the Streets and Highways Bond Fund to authorize the Director of Public Service to reimburse various utilities for utility relocation costs incurred in conjunction with the Columbus Traffic Signal System Phase F project to author the, authorize the expenditure of $250,000 from the Streets and Highway Bonds Fund to pay for the utility relocation costs and to declare an emergency. I would like to move to amend to 30-day legislation. Dr. Scalero. Bankston. Abstain. Barossa de Padilla. Yes. Dorans. Favor. Remy, President Harden. Yes, amend it. Thank you. Uh, can I move on to Veteran, Senior, and Disability Affairs? Please. Uh, we have one ordinance today. It's 0620-2023 to authorize. <laughs> I got you. To authorize and direct the appropriation and transfer of $532,489 from the Recreation and Parks Operating Fund to the Recreation and Parks Grant Fund to support Central Ohio Area Agency on Aging programs that help older adults and individuals with disabilities remain safe and independent in their homes and to declare an emergency. The COAAA Housing Assistance Program focuses on keeping older adults out of the shelter and preventative efforts to reduce eviction, displacement, and homelessness. The SPARK partnership between the Columbus Division of Fire and CO AAA began in 2018 to connect high volume users of emergency medical services, so EMS, to consistent medical care and supportive services. Along with the REACT, pro, uh, along with REACT SPARK has served the city's, has served as the city's first alternative crisis response. SPARK social workers and Columbus Fire Department paramedics conduct follow-up visits resource navigation, and wraparound support services to residents in crisis. Do my colleagues have any questions or comments? Seeing none, I move for passage. Second. Is there a second? Clerk, please call the row. Bankston, Barbosa de Padilla, Dorrance, Favor, Remy, President Harden. Passed. Thank you. That's all for my committees this evening. Thank you, Madam Chair. The next committee to come before council is the uh, veteran. Sorry, the uh, Recreation and Parks Committee, uh, chaired by Councilmember Dorrance today. Yeah. Thank you, Council President. Uh, in Recreation Parks, we have Ordinance 0436-2023 to authorize the Director of Recreation Parks to enter a contract with Orchard Hilts and McClint for the Marion Franklin and Tuttle Swimming Pool Replacement Design Project to authorize the appropriation of $420,000 within the CDGB fund in accordance with draft fiscal year 2023 annual action plan as approved by Council to authorize the transfer of $1,555,699 within the Recreation and uh, Recreation and Parks Voted Bond Fund to authorize an amendment of the 2022 capital improvement budget to authorize the expenditure of $1,975,699 from the CDGB fund and the Recreation and Parks Voted Bond Fund and declare an emergency. After serving the city of Columbus for more than 50 years, the pools at Marion Franklin and Tuttle Parks uh, need to be replaced in order to function in an efficient and safe manner. Uh, both pools will be more inclusive to persons with uh, various abilities and meet the requirements obtained by the public outreach activities, which were part of the Columbus Recreation Parks Aquatics Capital Improvement Plan, uh, with the intent of the design to increase the capacity for programming and increase attendance at the pools. Uh, emergency action is being requested so that design can be completed by December 2023, allowing for the opportunity for construction of the pools to be built um, with minimum impact swimming lessons in 2024. Do my colleagues have questions or comments? Seeing none, I move for passage. Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Barbosa de Padilla, Dorrance, Favor, Remy, President Harden. Passed. Thank you. Next, we have Ordinance 0439-2023 to authorize the Director of Recreation Parks to enter into a contract with Ryder Company for the Champions Bridge Superstructure Replacement and the Allen Creek uh, Stream Bank Stabilization Project to authorize the transfer of $1,672,960.98 within the Recreation and Parks Voted Bond Fund to authorize the amendment to the 2022 Capital Improvements Budget to authorize expenditure of $1,675,320 in the Recreation and Parks 
House voted bond fund and declared emergency. Uh, Champions Bridge is located along Allen Creek Trail between East and Soccer Fields and the seventh hole in the Champions Golf Course. In 2015, when the fa false decking was removed from the bridge, the, the deck deflated, leaving an uneven ride and feeling over the bridge. At the time, an investigation was performed and it was determined that the bridge had to had to load had a load posted which was prohibited emergency vehicles from crossing uh, the bridge is determined to be safe for, for pedestrians or rem remain open but closed to vehicular traffic the bridge however does not function per its intended design uh, an error in the design design of the bridge is the sole cause for the deflections and movement of the structure when in use the city attorney's office, along with the defense legal counsel, have been working for several years to mitigate the issue. Uh, for the safety of all trail users, it was decided that the bridge needed to be mitigated and that the damages would be pursued concurrently with construction activities, uh, perhaps after completion. Uh, emergency action is requested in the interest of public safety, as it is the imperative the bridge be uh, corrected to accommodate emergency vehicles' access to the Allen Creek Trail in that area. Mm. Do I make colleagues any questions or comments? Seeing none, I move for passage. Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Barbosa de Padilla, Dorrance, Remy, Favor, Dorrance, Favor, Remy, President Harden. Pass. Thank you. Next, we have 0748-2023 to authorize and direct the Director of Recreation and Parks to enter an agreement and accept a grant from the Ohio Department of Education in the amount of $2,500,000 for the 2023 Summer Food Program to authorize the appropriation of $2,500,000 from the Recreation and Parks Grant Fund to enter an agreement with Columbus City Schools in the amount of $2,300,000 $2, for the preparation and delivery of meals for the Summer Food Program to authorize the expenditure of, of $2,300,000 from the Recreation and Parks Grant Fund and declare an emergency. Uh, the summer food program is administered by the U.S. Department of Agriculture through, this, through the Ohio Department of Education. Uh, the program provides uh, nutritionally balanced breakfast, lunches, and snacks to qualified children in need during the summer months at no cost. Uh, the program will serve near, nearly 100,000 breakfasts, 150,000 lunch meals, and 20,000 snacks. Uh, thousands of children will be served throughout the program at the 100 to 150 sites throughout the greater Columbus area. Emergency action is being requested to ensure timely provision of free meals uh, for the program, which begins on June 1st. Do my colleagues have any questions or comments? Seeing none, I move for passage. Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Barbosa de Padilla, Dorn's favor, Remy, President Harden. Passed. Thank you, Council President. I'd like to move on to public utilities. Please. Thank you. Uh, first, we have Ordinance 0598-2023 to authorize the Director of Public Utilities and your construction contract with Complete General Construction Company for the Linden Neighborhood Storm Water System Improvement Phase 2 project in amount of up to $2,628,930.66 to authorize the appropriation of expenditure of up to $2,628,930.66 on the water, Ohio Water Development Loan, Loan Fund to authorize expenditure of up to $2,000 from the Storm Water uh, Geo fund uh, to amend the 2020 capital improvement budget to authorize the transfer of cash and the appropriation within the stormwater um, stormwater bond fund and declare an emergency uh, this project will mitigate street flooding and yard flooding and reduce uh, roadside drainage problems within or near the north linden area of columbus do my colleagues have questions or comments seeing none i move for passage clerk please call the roll Bankston, Barbosa de Padilla, Dorn's favor, Remy, President Harden. Pass. And finally, we have Ordinance 0613-2023 to authorize the Director of Public Utilities to enter a uh, contract for maintenance and repair services for WQAL instruments with Allegiant Technologies, Inc. to waive competitive bidding provisions of the Columbus City Codes and authorize the expenditure of up to $60,914 from the 2023 Division of Water Operating Fund. Um, the Department of Public Utilities Water Quality Analysis Lab has various scientific instruments that require maintenance and repair as serviced by this manufacturer. Um, the equipment is used to analyze and collect water samples as, ne as uh, necessary for regulatory compliance with clean water laws. Do my colleagues have questions or comments? Seeing none, I move for passage. Clerk, please call the roll. Banks, Timber, Rosa de Padilla, Dorn's favor, Remy, President Harden. Pass. Thank you, Council President. All I have this time. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This committee to come before Council is the Housing Committee. That committee is chaired by Councilmember Favor. Councilmember, the floor is yours. Thank you, Council President Harden. Tonight in the Housing Committee, we have Ordinance 901 2023 to authorize the Director of the Department of Development to modify a grant agreement with Rebuilding Together Central Ohio doing business as ModCon in an amount up to $500,000 to authorize the appropriation and expenditure of up to $500,000 from the Neighborhood Initiative Subfund to allow for advance payments to the organization in order to pay for reimbursement of costs starting September 1st, 2022 
and to extend the agreement term to June 30th, 2024, and to declare an emergency. On June 6, 2022, Columbus City Council passed Ordinance 1513-2022 to enter into a grant agreement with Rebuilding Together Central Ohio, doing business as ModCon in an amount up to $300,000 in support of two of the organization's home repair programs. Safe at Home, which is a citywide program that provides emergency home repair and modification services at no cost to vulnerable, senior, veteran, and, and or disabled residents. And the second program is a neighborhood specific home repair program in the Southfield Marion Franklin areas. This ordinance authorizes the Director of Development to modify the grant agreement in an amount up to $500,000 in support of the continuation of funding for these two home repair programs. Director Stevens, would you like to add any additional remarks at this time? Thank you, President Hardin, Chair Favors, Member of Council. Uh, this is, falls under our housing strategy on preserving uh, affordability and keeping people in their homes. And so these home repair programs are critical and appreciate the support. Thank you very much. Are there any questions or comments by my colleagues? Thank you, Madam Chair. Just uh, very supportive of, of this ordinance. Um, we are re-upping, basically, uh, this uh, relationship with the ModCom because we've seen that it works. Um, I, I'm very happy to join council members and council staff out as we uh, worked on a house in the Southfield area. Um, mm -hmm. And um, they are running through their resources. And mm -hmm. so, as uh, Director said, we see this as part of the preserve uh, plank of the housing strategy. And thank you for your leadership. Um, and the truth is, we hope that we can think about these types of programs through, uh, in other targeted neighborhoods throughout the city. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, thank you for your leadership and asking for support. Absolutely. And just a reminder that anyone in our community uh, can have access to these tools. And so if you're in need of uh, doing some repairs, I need to get out there in that lawn. They've got all of those, um, those tools out there for you to rent. Uh, and, and to use uh, as see fit. Uh, with that, I'd move for passage. Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Barossa de Padilla, wait, wait. Dorrance. I apologize. I think there's a speaker. Oh, oh my apologies. Oh. I, I, we do have a speaker this evening, uh, Mr. Nate Wilkins. Welcome back to Council. 1612 Arlington Avenue, Mr. Los Angeles Wilkins. Um, I'm going to be in support of this um, because my mother stayed in Mala Grogan at the time, and I tried to uh, get her house fixed. And I would love to see more money through the state of Ohio with this. Um, I, I just want to say a few things. My, my mother had lived up until 71 years old before she passed away. And um, I was trying to fix her house. And um, before she passed, you know, I tried to give her some help. She didn't want no handouts or nothing like that. But I wanted to request uh, $3.5 million. Before I lost my mother's house, I had to um, put some new windows in the house. And um, I no longer have the house on Peters Avenue, but I would love to see $3.5 million for this. And because we have a lot of aging people that's in their houses, older, can't fix things, windows, roof, gutters, side and windows, porches, and things and stuff like that. Um, I would love to see this statewide, through Lincoln counties, through small counties. Um, what I would suggest is something to be put in place beginning 2022 to 2035. Like I said again, I want to see this money be analyzed for the senior population, the disability, and the older population, and also the hearing and impaired. That's what I don't see enough of with people that's visually impaired and multi-handicapped, especially in wheelchairs. Um, like I said again, I'd like to see this money, $3.5 million. And this will be over the next 30 to 35 years. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your continued advocacy, uh, Mr. Wilkins, in the housing space. We truly do appreciate that. 
Um, if there are no additional questions or comments at this time, I'd move for uh, passage. Thanks, Tim. Barbosa de Padilla, Dorrance, favor, Remy, President Harden. Thank you. Next, we have Ordinance 939-2023 to authorize the Director of the Department of Development to implement the loan forgiveness policy associated with the Housing Division Homeowner Services Program on loans closed on behalf of the City of Columbus and to declare an emergency. The City of Columbus's Housing Division has operated programs focused on stabilizing low-income homeowners since at least 1986. These programs provide critical and emergency home repairs such as roof replacements, water heat replacement, foundation stabilization, and home modifications. These services are a critical tool to ensure that residents are not faced with homelessness or additional financial hardship. Historically, the programs have been funded by both local and federal funding sources in the form of both grants and loans. Recognizing that there is a limited useful life of the home improvement and value for the city's investment, as well as the importance of ensuring that the city's programs do not perpetuate inequitable outcomes or limit wealth building opportunities for those who have faced a legacy of systemic disinvestment. The Department of Development will implement a loan forgiveness policy for its home ownership services. Home repair is a key solution to Columbus's housing crisis. By preserving existing housing stock, we ensure that more safe and habitable units stay in our community and families are able to keep and build generational wealth. However, home repair assistance should never be the reason a family cannot put food on their table, pay their bills, or be burdened with debt. If we can support residents to repair and maintain safe and healthy homes, we can positively impact families for generations to come. This lien forgiveness legislation is an important step in addressing inequities created by redlining and other discriminatory practices and preserving wealth building opportunities for more black and brown homeowners. This legislation authorizes the Department of Development to establish and implement the loan forgiveness policy associated with the Housing Division of Homeowner Services programs on loans closed on behalf of the City of Columbus. This is really an exciting uh, policy that is rolling out. I applaud the mayor, Mayor Ginther, as well as the Department of uh, Development, Director Stevens and his team uh, for really uh, working hard on um, this legislation uh, for the last uh, two years or so. Director Stevens, uh, do you have any additional remarks you'd like to make at this time? President Hardin, Chair of Favors, Member of Council, thank you for the support on this. This is an exciting opportunity to really impact over 500 of our residents um, who have these liens in place on home improvements that were done over 10 years ago. It's not going to have a negative budget impact because we don't budget this program and this income from these loans as, as any type of program income. So we'll be able to help people stay in their homes, preserve that affordability, uh, and really help address our housing. Thank you. Uh, so just a technical question, uh, Director. Uh, do residents need to reach out to the department to, to know if they qualify for this uh, lien forgiveness program? No, we won't. once um, council approves this tonight, we will go back and, and look through the um, individuals who are in our portfolio who meet the qualifications. We will notify them and we will then move forward with the process of waiving the liens. Wonderful. Once again, very exciting uh, policy that is rolling out, um, truly taking a, a comprehensive approach to addressing our housing crisis. Uh, it's more than just putting a shovel in the ground, right? Um, and also passing tenant protections, but also understanding those historic inequities that we talk about. Uh, they truly are baked into every step of the home buying process. Uh, and this is one way to right that wrong, if you will. Are there any additional comments from my colleagues at this time? Seeing none, uh, once again, just want to give a um, round of applause to Mayor Ginther, Director Stevens, for the work that you've done. I'd move for passage. Second. Thanks, Tim Barbosa de Padilla. Dorn's favor, Remy, President Harden. Thank you. Next, I'll move to Ordinance 951-2023 to authorize the appropriation and expenditure of up to $1.25 million of 2021 and 2022 Home Investment Partnership Program grant funds from the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development to authorize the Director of the Department of Development to enter into a commitment letter, loan agreement, promissory note, mortgage, and restrictive covenant with Poplar Finn Place, LLC, for the Poplar Finn Place project and to declare an emergency. 
Poplar Fem Face will be placed on a 6.4 acre site on Chatterton Road in Southeast Columbus. The proposed three-story building provides 44 one-bedroom units of permanent supportive housing prioritized for individuals over the age of 55 who meet the state of Ohio's permanent supportive housing policy framework. Of the 44 units, 35 will prioritize individuals who meet the HUD definition of homelessness, and the remaining nine units will be targeted for use by individuals who have a severe mental health diagnosis. Community Housing Network, the developer of Poplar Fin Place, has been providing affordable housing to individuals experiencing homelessness, mental illness, addiction, and trauma-related issues since 1987. CHN will utilize rent subsidies for all 44 units in the property, which will allow residents with incomes below 30% of the area median income to afford this housing. It is estimated that eight units will be supported by home funds. CHN's on-site staff will orient tenants to living in a supportive housing program, assist them with housing-related issues, and provide crisis intervention, conflict resolution, and daily assistance. In addition, residents will also be referred to other agencies for medical and dental needs, material needs, and legal assistance. CHN will also enter into an annually renewable contract with National Church residents supported permanent supportive housing services to provide accredited supportive services at the new facility. Poplar's Finn Place building amenities will include occupational therapy, physical therapy room service, uh, service partner offices, laundry room, community room with full kitchen, and a medical suite with an, with an exam room. Uh, once again, this is a really great project um, that is helping uh, some of our individuals that fall into that deep, uh, low income, um, area median income that we talk about uh, that is often challenging to, uh, to develop. And so we appreciate the work of a community um, housing network that does great work in our community. Director Stevens, anything additional you'd like to add at this time? President Hardin, Chair Favor, members of council, this legislation advances three pillars of our housing strategy, building more units, investing in projects where the market typically does not, and including all our residents in housing opportunities. We continue to focus on housing those individuals experiencing homelessness in our community, and this ordinance, is, this ordinance advances those efforts by helping to fund the construction of 44 permanent supportive houses. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, with that, I would move for passage. Clerk, please call the roll. Banks, Tim Barbosa de Padilla, Dorrance, Favor, Remy, President Harden. Thank you. Uh, Council President Mann, please go back to uh, consent page 15, ordinance 917 2023. Please. Uh, we have to authorize the appropriation and expenditure of up to $760,000 of the 2021 and 2022 Home Investment Partnerships Program entitlement grant from the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development and to enter into a commitment letter, loan agreement, promissory note, mortgage and restrictive covenant with the Healthy Rental Homes 7 LLC to construct single family and duplex rental homes in an amount up to $760,000 and to declare an emergency. At this time, I'd, ask, uh, I'd like to postpone to April 24th. Clerk, please call the roll. Thanks, Tim. Abstain. Barbosa de Padilla. Yes. Dorans? Yes. Favor? Yes. Remy? Yes. President Harden? Yes. Postponed. Thank you. May I move on to criminal justice and judiciary? Please. Uh, tonight in criminal justice and judiciary, we have Ordinance 876-2023. Uh, uh, to authorize and direct the city attorney to settle the lawsuit known as Serena Jackson versus Joe Richard et al. Case number 221-CV-0574 pending in the United States District Court for the Southern District of Ohio to authorize the expenditure of the sum of $225,000.00 in the settlement of this lawsuit and to declare an emergency. This ordinance is submitted to settle the lawsuit known as Serena Jackson versus Joe Richard et al. Uh, in the, excuse me, in, that's located in the Southern District of Ohio, case number 221-CV-0574. On February 5th, 2021, the plaintiff, Ms. Serena Jackson, refiled a lawsuit in the Court of Common Pleas of Franklin County, Ohio, 
against Joe Richard and the city of Columbus, in which she claimed that Joe Richard sexually harassed and assaulted her while she employed as, was employed as a cadet with the city of Columbus Division of Fire. She alleges the city knew or should have known about Richard's conduct and failed to stop. On February 9th, 2021, the lawsuit was removed in the United States District Court for the Southern District, Ohio. Uh, tonight, we are joined by uh, Deputy City Attorney Laura Baker Morsh. Uh, do you have any additional remarks you'd like to make at this time? Thank you, Council Member Faber. Uh, just wanted to add, in addition to the remarks that have already you have already made regarding this particular settlement, um, that after evaluating the claims and the risks of continued litigation against the city, that the settlement in the amount of $250,000, of which the city will pay $225,000 and Joe Richard will pay the remaining $25,000, was deemed acceptable by the City of Columbus Department of Public Safety. The settlement will also release the City of Columbus and its employees, including former employee Joe Richard. And uh, the last comment I wanted to make is that this was a, a Title VII of, of the Civil Rights Act of 1991 claim that was made. Thank you for that. And um, I also provide an opportunity for our public safety a department to make any remarks they'd, they'd like to at this time. Thank you, President Harden, Chair Favor, members of council. Allow me to underscore that the city of Columbus does not and will not tolerate sexual harassment in any manner. We have written policies and trainings that are designed to keep harassment from happening. We have policies and trainings designed to inform our employees how to report allegations of harassment. And should allegations be made, we have trained investigators who immediately initiate uh, an investigation. In fact, as soon, in this case, as soon as complaints were brought forward, the Division of Fire Leadership elevated them to the Safety Director's Office. Swift action was taken to remove Joe Richard from the Training Academy, and a thorough investigation was initiated. The investigation made clear his actions were unacceptable and incompatible with the values and mission of Columbus Fire. Victims should never suffer in silence. The director's office wants to hear directly from any employee who believes they're experiencing sexual harassment. And that's why in 2019, the safety director created the assistant director of equal employment opportunity compliance dedicated solely to EOC issues. The creation of this position allows employees to bypass the chain of command and come directly to the office of the safety director. I also want to underscore that in this court case, we refuse to represent or provide an attorney to Mr. Richard for his legal defense. Therefore, Mr. Richard, who is no longer employed by the city, had to pay for his own attorney and litigation expenses out of his own pocket during the pendency of this lawsuit. Moreover, Mr. Richard is now contributing monies out of his own pocket for the settlement of this lawsuit. On behalf of the Department of Safety, I want to express my deep remorse and apology to the plaintiff. Moreover, I want to express to any employee of any employer that if you are being harassed, please promptly notify your employer. And for any person who harasses another, be forewarned of the grave consequences. Professional harm, personal, family, relationship harm, financial harm. On behalf of safety, I recommend approval of this settlement. Thank you. Thank you very, very much for those comments this evening. Are there any additional questions or comments by my colleagues this evening? Well, we, we do appreciate um, uh, the action that has been taken by uh, the Department of uh, Public Safety, as well as our city attorney's office, uh, to uh, try to bring uh, restitution uh, as quickly as possible uh, to to the victim um, in this case. Um, and uh, we can't underscore enough uh, that if any employee uh, should be um, uh, on the receiving end of, of um, this type of behavior, um, that there are measures in place uh, to ensure uh, that we get to, to the bottom of it, of it, excuse me, as quickly as possible. Uh, with that, I will move for passage. Second. Second, please call the roll. Bankston, Barossa de Padilla, Dorrance Favor, Remy, President Hardin. Passed. Thank you. And last but certainly not least, may I please uh, go back to the Health and Human Services Committee for consent? Please. Uh, thank you. Uh, tonight, uh, in the consent, we have 
uh, Ordinance 759-2023, and I will turn the podium over to uh, my fellow colleague, Councilmember Barossa de Padilla. Thank you, Chair Favor. Uh, Ordinance 0759-2023 to authorize the Board of Health to modify an existing contract with the Ohio State University for the provision of technical assistance services for the period of September 30th, 2022 through September 29th, 2023 to authorize an expenditure of $45,000 from the Health Department Grants Fund to pay the cost of and to declare an emergency. Um, I would like to move to postpone this for the April 24th agenda. Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston. Yes. Barossa de Padilla. Yes. Dorrance. Yes. Favor. Yes. Remy. Yes. President Harden. Yes. Postponed. And then I'd like to go back to page 17. I'm going to hand it back over to Chair Favor. Thank you. Uh, we have Ordinance 866-2023 to authorize the Board of Health to enter into a contract with the Research Institute at Nationwide Children's Hospital for the provision of services allowable under the grant for persons with HIV or AIDS in Central Ohio to authorize the Board to modify the budget of this contract for the sole purpose of reallocating funds amongst the vendors in this same program without the need for additional legislation to authorize the expenditure of $86,029 from the Health Department Grants Fund to pay the cost thereof and to declare an emergency. At this time, I'd like to move to postpone to April 24th. Second. Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston. Abstain. Barossa de Padilla. Yes. Dorrance. Yes. Favor. Yes. Remy. Yes. President Harden. Yes. Postpone. I believe that is all I have in my committee. Uh, there's one more, I one believe more. that. Yep. I'm, I was wrong. So you want to kick it back over to me? I, I kick uh, it back over now. <laughs> and this is this should be their last one. Ordinance 2010-21-2023 to authorize the appropriation and expenditure of an amount not to exceed $230,000 from the Neighborhood Economic Development Fund to authorize the appropriation and expenditure of an amount not to exceed $35,000 from the General Fund Neighborhood Initiative Subfund to authorize the Director of the Development, uh, Direct Department of Development or designee to execute a grant agreement with the Tony R. Wells Foundation doing business as the Wells Foundation in an amount not to exceed $265,000 to provide a one-time cash payment and furniture directly to each, each leaseholder that was displaced from the Latitude 5 25 apartment complex on December 25th, 2022, and to pay for expenses incurred before the purchase order was approved and to declare an emergency. So we'll talk a little bit more about this when it comes back onto the agenda, but I do want to, Director Stevens, if there is anything that you want to say today, and then we'll talk a little bit more about this when we bring it back onto another agenda. Uh, thank you. I have nothing to add this evening. Thank you. So we're going to move to postpone this for our agenda on the 24th of April. Second. Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston? Yes. Robosa de Padilla? Yes. Dorrance? Yes. Favor? Abstain. Remy? Yes. President Harden? Yes. Postpone. That is all for Health and Human Services. Chair Favor, I'll give the floor back to you. All right. Um, why don't we go ahead and you want to go? Uh, next committee coming for council is public safety committee chaired by Councilman Remy. Councilman, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Council President Harden. Tonight I have three ordinances in public safety. First one's Ordinance 120 to author 120 2023 to authorize the Director of Finance and Management and Director of Public Safety on behalf of the Division of Fire to enter into a contract for the purchase of consumable supplies and preventative maintenance agreements, respectively, with Stryker Sales Corporation for Stryker Power Load Cots, bar Bariatric Cots, and Lucas Devices for use in daily emergency services and emergency medical services to waive the, com the competitive bidding provisions of the Columbus City Code to authorize the expenditure of $104,028.65 from the general fund and to declare an emergency. Emergency. Striker power load cots are purchased on a continuing basis for installation in all new build emergency medical squads and striker consumable parts, pads, straps, batteries, etc. are purchased at regular intervals to, due to the normal daily utilization of these cots. The Division of Fire purchases these cots and supplies directly from striker versus a resale provider, which allows the division to secure the lowest pricing available. As the Division of Fire has standardized on the striker load cot product, it is critical for the division to be able to maintain a stock of both this equipment and consumable supplies. Striker Sales Corporation, LLC, 
Chelsea is sole manufacturer, distributor, and authorized service agent for the Stryker Power Load Cots. Um, Director, could you speak just to the waiver of the competitive bidding on this contract, please? Uh, Chairman Remy, it was about five years ago. Through a competitive process, we chose the Stryker Cots. So for uniformity and standardizations, we, we simply uh, purchase additional parts uh, and supplies and cots each year. This is simply that, uh, that con standard contract. Uh, bidding is waived because we get it cheaper directly through the manufacturer as opposed to going out to the distributors. Thank you very much, Director. Are there any questions or comments from my colleagues? Seeing none, I move for passage. Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Barbosa, De Padilla, Dorrance, Favor, Remy, President Harden. Pass. Next, I have Ordinance 735 2023 to authorize the city auditor to appropriate $53,182 within the General Government Grants Fund project to authorize the Director of Finance and Management to associate general budget reservations resulting from this ordinance with the appropriate universal term contract purchase agreements with George Byers Sons, Inc. on behalf of the Department of Public Safety, Division of Fire, for the purchase of a light duty truck or sport utility vehicle for REACT operations to authorize the expenditure of $53,182 from the General Government Grants Fund 2020 2220 and to declare an emergency. The Department of Public Safety Division of Fire requests approval to purchase a light duty truck or sport utility vehicle for use with the city's rapid response emergency addiction crisis team react react is an innovative outreach service operated by the division of fire to actively address the opioid crisis react outreach includes firefighters paramedics crisis intervention teams certified peace officers a substance use case manager a registered sud nurse a family case manager and a trauma specialist team members assess immediate health needs provide resource referrals and create opportunities for users and family household members to link with harm reduction supplies treatment programs trauma services and social benefit supports are there any questions or comments from my colleagues seeing none I move for passage Clerk, please call the row banks Barossa de Padiva Remy President Harden Passed. Finally, I have Ordinance 778, 2023, to authorize the Director of Public Safety on behalf of the Division of Police to modify the current contract with Proto Inc. for the continuation of towing management services to authorize an expenditure of $1,800,000 from the general fund and to declare an emergency. The Division of Police is responsible for the safety and welfare of the traveling public on all public streets, state routes, interstates, and waterways, as well as those endangered by parking violations, accidents, or abandoned vehicles and watercrafts within the metropolitan Columbus area, as well as on city-owned land. In an effort to improve the transportation network and access innovative technology, the city sought a smart solution to towing management services. Are there any questions or comments from my colleagues? Seeing none, I move for passage. Clerk, please call the row. Bankston, Barbosa de Padilla, Dorns, Favor, Remy, President Harden. Passed. Thank you. That is all I have this evening. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Is there a motion to uh, recess? Clerk, please call the roll. Thanks, Tim. Barbosa de Padilla, Dorrance, Favor, Remy, President Harden. We are in recess. We will start zoning in five minutes.
legislation are legally considered impacted parties and therefore are permitted to speak before council on variances based on the advice of the city attorney's office. Speakers that do not meet these qualifications are not permitted to speak, again, pursuant to the advice of the city attorney's office, and speakers will be asked under penalty of perjury to confirm their status as an impacted party prior to giving testimony to counsel for variance. As a reminder, this requirement does not apply to speaking before counsel on, a re on rezoning legislation. Representatives of an area commission and applicants are always able to speak on an ordinance and do not need to fill out a speaker slip. On the advice of the city attorney's office, I will now swear in city staff. Please stand and raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give shall be the truth and nothing but the truth as you shall answer under the pains or penalty of perjury? If so, please say I do. I do. Thank you. Please let the record reflect that Tim Dietrich from the Department of Building and Zoning <laughs> Services and Dan Bleschman from the Department of Public Service have been sworn in. First, we have Ordinance 0855-2023 to rezone 2480 Walcott Road, being 3.21 acres located on the southeast corner of Walcott Road and Roberts Road from R1 Residential District and C3 Commercial District to CPD Commercial Plant Development District. The applicant of Skill Can Go Development LLC, care of Andy Reichlin, uh, proposed use of a fuel sales convenience store and eating and drinking establishment. The city's report recommendation is approval. Uh, the Development Commission's recommendation is approval 4-0. Um, the Far West Side Area Commission's recommendation is, is also approval 7-0. Uh, we did have a speaker sp uh, to speak in favor of this ordinance, Mr. Josh Miller. However, he at this time has removed his speaker slip. Um, do my colleagues have any questions or comments? Seeing none, I move for passage. Okay. Barbosa de Padilla, Dorns, favor, Remy, President Harden. Pass. Thank you. Next, we have ordinance 0859-2023 to rezone 6500 Tussing Road, being 46.68 plus acres located on the north side of Tussing Road, 900 plus feet east of Bryce Road from CPD Commercial Plan Development District and LM Limited Fact Manufacturing District to LM Limited Fact Manufacturing District. The applicant is 93OHRPT uh, LLC, care of Jill Changeman. The proposed use of the limited manufacturer and industrial development. Cities Park recommendation is approval. Development Commission recommendation is approval. Far East Area Commission's recommendation is also approval. Uh, do I have any colleagues have questions or comments? Seeing none, I move for passage. Barbosa de Padilla, Dorrance, Favor, Remy, President Harden. Thank you. Next, we have Ordinance 0879 2023 to rezone. 1095 West 3rd Avenue being uh, 0.31 plus acres located on the southeast corner of West 3rd Avenue and Oxley Road from N Manufacturing District to AR1 Apartment Apartment Residential District. The applicant is Roby Development, uh, care of Dave Perry Agent, proposed use of a multi-unit residential development. Cities Department recommendation is approval. Development Commission's recommendation is approval 5-0. Uh, Fifth by Northwest Area Commission's recommendation is approval 4-1. Do I my colleagues have questions or comments? Seeing none, I move for passage. Clerk, please call the roll. Barbosa de Padilla, Dorrance, Favor, Ramey, President Harden. Pass. Thank you. Next, we have Ordinance 0913-2023 to rezone 7480 Sawmill Road, being 1.86 plus acres located on the east side of Sawmill Road, 215 plus feet north of uh, Hard Road from CPD Commercial Plan Development District to CPD Commercial Plan Development District. The applicant of Skilkin Gold Development LLC, care of Drew Miller, proposed use of fuel sales, convenience store, and eating and drinking establishment. City's part of recommendation is approval. The Development Commission's recommendation is approval 4-0. The Far Northwest Co Coalition's uh, recommendation is approval 4-2. Um, do my colleagues have any questions or comments? Seeing none, I move for passage. Okay. So just call the roll. Barbosa de Padilla, Doran's favor, Remy, President Harden. Pass. Thank you. Next, we have Ordinance 0740-2023 to rezone 2870 Allen Creek Drive, being 4.17 plus acres, located on the east side of Allen Creek Drive, 740 plus feet north of Watkins Road from PUD 8 Plan Development District to AR 12 Apartment Residential District. And the applicant is Homeport, care of Laura Comack, attorney, proposed use of a multi unit residential development. C Smart recommendation is approval. Development Commission's recommendation is approval 4 1. Far South Columbus Air Commission's recommendation is approval 9-0. Do my colleagues have any questions or comments? Seeing none, I move for passage. Okay. Clerk, please call the roll. Barbosa de Padilla, Doran's favor, Remy, President Harden. Pass. Thank you. Next, we move into the council variances of, of our agenda. First, we have ordinance 0835-2023. 
to grant a variance provisions of section 3332.035 R3 residential district, 3332.05 A4 area district lot width requirements, and 3332.13 R3 area dis district uh, requirements in Columbus City Codes for the property located at 1334 21st Avenue to permit a two unit dwelling for the reduced development standards in the R3 residential district. Uh, the applicant is Healthy Home, I'm sorry, Healthy Linden Homes, care of Emily Long Ray, Rayfield, proposed use of a two unit dwelling. Seas Department recommendation is approval. South Linden Air Commission recommendation is also approval. We do have one public speaker signed up to speak in favor of this project, Mr. Charles Lester. Is Mr. Lester here with us? Mr. Lester, if you wouldn't mind raising your right hand. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give shall be the truth and nothing but the truth as you shall answer the pains or penalty of perjury? If so, please say I do. I do. Thank you. And again, just a reminder earlier on our uh, requirements for folks to be an impacted party. But the floor is yours, sir. Good evening. Um, my name is Reverend Charles Leister. I'm a uh, senior pastor at New Beginning Christian Center, and I'm our member, our congregation is a member of the Bread Organization. And uh, the purpose of us speaking on behalf of this variance and of uh, the efforts of the Nationwide Children's Hospital uh, is to support the legislation. I believe there's like 12 variances this evening uh, related to the Linden area and providing, the goal of which is to provide affordable and safe housing through the Nationwide Children's Hospital, healthy neighborhoods, healthy families. As a member of the BREAD Steering Committee for Families First and Housing Now, uh, our campaign, we are grateful to have been working with uh, Council Member Faber uh, on behalf of affordable housing over a number of years uh, because of the extreme need for affordable housing and not only affordable housing, but safe, uh, stable, and secure housing for our citizens. We are encouraged by significant initiatives that have been announced by the administration in Mayor Ginther's State of the City Address and City Council Hardin uh, uh, initiatives recently announced uh, concerning the need for affordable housing and initiatives to address that. We also are working with Mayor Ginther's administration and Franklin County Commissioners to allocate one third of the American rescue dollars available in the county and city for affordable housing. We support Council Member Doran's initiatives and collaboration with Nationwide Children's Hospital uh, to recommend this legislation resulting in variances for the Linden community to provide not only affordable but healthy homes for our citizens, that their families, especially those making less than 30,000 a year annual income uh, to afford. Healthy, safe, and stable home environments are not only an impact the adults within each home, but especially their children. The anxiety, worry, and stress produced by a home environment that is not healthy, not safe, and not stable contribute to violence, verbal and physical abuse, crime, low educational achievement, and behavioral issues, not only for the adults, but especially the children in school. This impacts the achievement of those individuals' potential and their future. Therefore, we support the efforts of Council Member Dorrance and the Nationwide Children's Hospital Initiative on these matters. As a religious leader in our community, May I conclude with this fact. The phrase, the poor, appears 639 times in scriptures. This reflects the significant concern of the heart of God for those that are poor and are marginalized in our community. May I, in conclusion, reflect on these two passages from Proverbs. The rich man's wealth is his strong city the destruction of the poor is their poverty. He who oppresses the poor to increase his riches, and he who gives to the rich will surely come to poverty. I encourage you, counsel, 
to consider that in your plans for our community and ask for wisdom in decisions we make on behalf of all of our citizens for their common good. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor. I appreciate you being here tonight and certainly Brad's advocacy on this topic. And I think uh, the series of uh, variances for the Healthy Homes Program is a great demonstration of when things are working well in our community, this is what it looks like. So thank you for being here tonight. Thank you, um, Do my colleagues have any questions or comments? Seeing none, I move to accept the entire set report into evidence as an exhibit. Second. Clerk, please call the roll. Barossa de Padilla, Dorn's favor, Remy, President Harden. Accept it. Thank you. And next move to adopt the findings of staff, the findings of council. Second. Clerk, please call the roll. Barossa de Padilla, Dorn's favor, Remy, President Harden. Adopt it. And finally, I move for passage. Second. Clerk, please call the roll. Barossa de Padilla, Dorn's favor, Remy, President Harden. Pass. Thank you. Next, we have Ordinance 0836-2023 to grant a variance of provisions of Section 3332.035, R3 Residential District 3332.05A4 Area District, district Lot Width Requirements, and 3332.13 R3 Area dist District Requirements, the Columbus City Codes, for the property located at 1340 21st Avenue to permit a two-unit dwelling with reduced development standards in the R3 Residential District. The applicant is Healthy Linden Homes, care of Emily Long Ray Rayfield, proposed use of a two-unit dwelling, Suits Department recommendations approval. South Linden Air Commission's recommendation is also approval. I first move to accept the entire staff report into evidence as an exhibit. Second. Clerk, please call the roll. Barbosa de Padilla, Dorrance, Favor, Remy, President Harden. Accept it. And next move to adopt the finance of staff as the finance of council. Clerk, please call the roll. Barbosa de Padilla, Dorrance, Favor, Remy, President Harden. Adopt it. And I finally move for passage. Second. Clerk, please call the roll. Barbosa de Padilla, Dorrance, Favor, Remy, President Harden. Passed. Thank you. Next, we have Ordinance 0838-2023 to grant a variance of provisions of Section 3332.035, R3 Residential District 3312.49C, minimum number of parking spaces required, 3332.05A4 Area just area district lot with requirements and 3332.13 r3 area district requirements the columbus city code so property located at 1477 uh what dash 141481 uh 26th avenue to permit a two-unit dwelling on each parcel with reduced development standards in the r3 residential district uh, at this time, a, due to a revised site plan, uh, city staff is requesting to postpone this ordinance into our next zoning uh, committee meeting in two weeks. Uh, if there's no objections, I move to postpone this ordinance till April 17th, 2023. Second. Clerk, please call the roll. de Padilla, Dorn's favor, Remy, President Harden. Postpone. Thank you. Next, we have Ordinance 0839-2023 to grant variance provisions of Section 3353.03, C4 permitted uses, 3309.14 height districts of the Columbus City Code, so property located at 2337 Kimberly Parkway East to permit a multi-unit residential development to produce development standards in the C2 commercial district. The applicant is Woda Cooper Companies, Inc., care of Dave Perry agent, proposed use of a multi-unit residential development. City's part recommendation is approval. Mid-East Area Commission's recommendation is also approval. I first move to accept the entire staff report into evidence as an exhibit. Clerk, please call the roll. Barbosa de Padilla, Dorrance, Favor, Remy, President Harden. Accept it. Next, I move to adopt the findings of staff as the findings of council. Clerk, please call the roll. Provost de Padilla, Dorrance, Favor, Remy, President Harden. Adopt it. Thank you. And finally, move for passage. Clerk, please call the roll. Provost de Padilla, Dorrance, Favor, Remy, President Harden. Pass. Thank you. Next, we have Ordinance 0840-2023 to grant advance provisions of Section 3356.03, C4 per permitted uses, and 3309.14 height districts of the Columbus City Code, so the property located at 4323 East Point Drive to permit a multi-unit residential development with reduced development standards in the C4 commercial district. The applicant is Woda, Woda Cooper Companies, Inc., care of Dave Perry Agent, proposed use of a multi-unit residential development. City's part and recommendation is approval. Mid-East Area Commission's recommendation is also approval. I first move to accept the entire staff report into evidence as an exhibit. Second. Clerk, please call the roll. Barossa de Padilla, Dorrance, Favor, Remy, President Harden. Accept it. And next move to adopt the findings of staff as the findings of council. Second. Clerk, please call the roll. Barossa de Padilla, Dorrance, Favor, Remy, President Harden. Adopt it. And finally, move for passage. Second. Clerk, please call the roll. Barossa de Padilla, Dorrance, Favor, Remy, President Harden. Passed. Next, we have Ordinance 0854-2023 to grant a... Um, to grant a variance provisions of section 3332.38H, private garages, 3332.21 building lines, and 3332.38G, parking garage, the Columbus City Code, so property located at 
51 East 4th Avenue to permit uh, habitable space above a detached garage with reduced development standards in the R4 residential district. The applicant is Julia Bullock, proposed use of the habitable space above detached garage. City Department recommend recommendation is approval. Italian Village Commission's recommendation is also approval. I first move to accept the entire staff report. You do evidence as an exhibit. Second. Clerk, please call the row. Barbosa de Padilla, Doran's favor, Remy President Harden. Accept it. I next move to adopt the findings of staff, the findings of council. Clerk, please call the row. Barbosa de Padilla, Doran's favor, Remy President Harden. Adopt it. And finally, I move for passage. Second. Clerk, please call the roll. Barbosa de Padilla, Doran's favor, Remy President Harden. Pass. Thank you. Next, we have ordinance 0881-2023 to grant a variance uh, from provisions of sections 3333.02 AR12 ARLD and AR1 apartment residential district use, 3309.14 height districts, 3321.05 B2 vision clearance, 3333.15 base of computing area, 3333.18 F building lines, 3333.255 perimeter yard of the Columbus City Council property located at 1095 West 3rd Avenue, permit a five unit apartment building and a four unit dwelling on the same lot with reduced development standards in the AR1 apartment residential district. The applicant is Roby Development, care of Dave Perry agent. Proposed use a multi unit residential development. Seas Park re recommendations approval. Fifth by Northwest Area Commission's recommendation is also approval for one. Uh, we have a one public speaker to sign to speak against this ordinance. So at this time we'll have the staff provide a presentation for the ordinance. Mr. Dietrich, the floor is yours. Chair Dorans, President Harden, members of council, the applicant has received a recommendation of approval from staff and the Development Commission for a concurrent rezoning to the AR1 apartment residential district. The applicant proposes a five unit apartment building and a four unit dwelling on the same lot. Variances for building arrangement, building height, vision clearance, lot coverage, building line, and perimeter yard are included in the request. Staff finds the requested variances to be supportable as they will allow the site to be redeveloped with a multi unit residential development that is consistent with the emerging development pattern along West 3rd Avenue and with the other residential redevelopment proposals in the area, and therefore our recommendation is approval. Thank you, Mr. Dietrich. Um, want to invite our uh, public speaker that signed up to speak against this ordinance, Mr. Robert McKnight. Good you? evening. Um, would you mind raising your right hand and I'll swear you in. Do you swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give shall be nothing but the truth as you shall answer under uh, pains or penalty of perjury? If so please say I do. I do. Floor is yours, sir. Could I get some clarification? I'm five feet south of this property line, and I submitted all the proper paperwork to, pe to speak publicly, and I'm here representing a lot of people in the neighborhood who mm -hmm. are against this. I want to make sure it's okay for me to speak. Is So I can bring in the city attorney's office. So because it's a variance uh, and council's operating in a quasi-judicial capacity and, and our um, our decisions here can be appealed to a court. Um, it's limited on who's actually defined legally as an impacted party, which is anyone who owns property within 125 feet of this parcel that's the subject of the of the variance. Um, so I don't I don't know if that answered your question. If if you own property within 125 feet um, of the subjected property, you qualify as an impacted party, and therefore you can testify before the body. So if you qualify as that, you, you can speak before the body. I'm five feet south of that. So I'm outside of who was notified. However, there was uh, a misunderstanding because the people who were impacted uh, were kind of using me as the filter and mm -hmm. we didn't realize or else they would have signed up to speak. So I was wondering if you would like to hear from the neighborhood if you can make an exception for me to speak today. So I'm going to defer to the city attorney's office because of the capacity that we're operating in, um, it matters what evidence gets presented in front of us. So it, unfortunately, it's not make me deciding to make an exception. It's whether or not um, we make it. We, we have other neighbors here that could speak what I wrote. So uh, Mr. Mc, Mr. McKnight, are, are you representing them in a representative capacity? Are you an attorney or are you their agent? No, I'm not. Okay, and you yourself are, your property is where in relationship to the property that's currently before council? I am exactly one property south of outside of the 125 foot line. So I am- One property, I'm sorry, are you adjacent? No. Are you an adjacent property? Is there a property between you and the property that's the subject of the variance? I am adjacent to a property that is affected by this. Okay. So you're adjacent to an adjacent property? Yes. Yes. 
I was not I was not notified as an impacted party. Okay. I'm five feet south of that. And do you can you articulate for the record uh, the manner in which your specific property would be impacted by the specific request for variance? Um, all of the exact same ways that the other six properties. No, and I'm, I'm asking though, are you able to articulate how your property, your personal property, would be impacted or not impacted by the requested variance that's before council? Um, I think I could, yeah. If, if you're able to articulate how your property specifically would be impacted, yes. then you would be able to speak. But you have to, it's not about whether or not it's going to impact, quote unquote, the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. It's whether or not the specific thing that they are asking for would impact the value of your property. And this is the legal standard. It's not value. It's, it's, it's in, yeah, it's negative impact upon the value of your property, the ability to resell your property or the value of, it, of keeping it in that particular way, Aren't or its to... use, or its use, or uh, an impact, a negative impact upon its use. Aren't there parts in the code that say um, public safety, health, and welfare, welfare is subject to interpretation, but I didn't think it was specifically limited to value. Those are the things that council can consider in granting the variance or not, but if you're talking about whether or not you have standing to speak as a, an adjacent property owner, that's a different standard from what the standard that uh, council is addressing when they're making a quasi-adjudicatory decision about whether or not the variance fits within those particular factors. The question is your standing, not, not their decision. I guess if I were to answer that, I would say yes. I don't have a way to back that up. You have to be able to articulate that, and that, that's the basis for the particular objection. So it can't just be we're not in favor of it. It has to be it's going to actually negatively impact my property. If you're able to make an assertion of that on the record, then you can speak to it. If you're not able to make an assertion that it will personally impact your property, then it would not be proper in a quasi-adjudicatory hearing because this is not a legislative act. It's, an, it's a quasi-judicial quasi act. I think I can articulate that. Okay. So to be clear, you have to, uh, in order for you to have standing, what the city attorney is telling you is that you have to articulate it here. Because if this is on the record for purposes of if, if, in fact, someone were to appeal our determination, it would need to be included in sort of the forum that is happening right now. So when she says you need to articulate it on the record, unfortunately, we mean we need you to articulate it right now before us in order to qualify uh, because you're outside of that 125 foot feet. Um, so we're going one step further and saying, is there a way for you to articulate this? And again, that, that's not me saying, hey, you know, I, I need extra from you. You need to be able to say, hey, this variance um, that's contemplated in this legislation would impact my property negatively. Therefore, I qualify. I know this is unusual and not what you're expecting to walk up Mr. here. And I, and I apologize about that. But that's sort of, again, we're trying to comply with the requirements for, for, for this body. Mr. Chair, if you don't yeah. mind. Uh, sir, did you say that there, were, there are representatives in the room that are within the 125-foot barrier, but there they are, just weren't? They, sorry, this is loud. They did not fill Sign out up. the proper, yes, okay. because it was. So in, in, in this isn't what we'll do. Um, yeah. So um, I'm actually going to ha have a two-minute recess to confer with the city attorney's office real quick, and then we'll jump right back into this, okay? okay. So uh, I'm going to move for a uh, two-minute recess. Second. Clerk, please call the roll. Barossa de Padilla, Doran's favor, Remy, President Harden. Recess.
Clerk, please call the roll. Rosa De Padilla, Doran's favor, Remy President Harden. We are reconvening in the zoning committee. Thank you, Council President. Um, so at this time, um, we just had a prior discussion around who was permitted under the, under the, the variance rules to speak before council. We do have an impacted party who received notice of this uh, in chamber. So at this point, I'm going to call Rebecca Perkins uh, to the podium. Ms. Perkins, welcome to council. Um, would you mind raising your right hand? Sure. Uh, do you swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give shall be the uh, truth, nothing but the truth, as you shall answer in a pains or penalty of perjury? If so, please say I do. I do. And Ms. Perkins, um, so we just had a discussion around folks being an impacted party, so I just want to ask on the record, uh, you received notice of, um, of, of this meeting tonight, and you own property within 125 feet of the lot that's the subject of this variance. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Um, and that, that lot is, you are adjacent property owner across the street, just? It's up the alley from it. Okay, and you were within the 125 feet, and just saying again, you received notice of this. Yes. Okay, Ms. Perkins, the floor is yours. I even have a copy with me. You okay, <laughs> well, you're under, under <laughs> you've been sworn in, we'll, we'll trust you. Okay, and again, I wasn't planning on this, so I did send a letter to Mr. Rose, which I'm just gonna go ahead and read. Um, Rob had some great notes, and we really trusted him, but um, I'll go ahead with this, if that's okay. So I just wanted to say that um, we are in opposition of the building proposal from Mr. Roby at 1095 West 3rd Avenue, 43212. My husband and I have lived in our home on Holly Avenue since 1994. During our time on Holly Avenue, we have seen the property have various businesses. It also was abandoned for a while before the former AAA auto shop took over the property and the place was filled with stray cats along with various vermin. As neighbors, we are happy to see the property become residential. We have no problem with the proposed five residential buildings on the north side of the property along 3rd Avenue. It is the south side with an additional four residences that give us concern. With the renovation and extension on the original building on the site, on the east side, along with the nine condos, the site would be very dense. We as neighbors met immediately when we heard of the present plans for the property. One neighbor, Mr. McInnes, reached out to Mr. Roby, about five of us meeting him with our concerns, hoping he would work with the neighborhood. The meeting kept getting postponed for a few weeks. When we did finally meet and shared specific concerns, our concerns were brushed off. Mr. Roby promised us addresses of other construction sites, but we never received them. We later found that most of his new builds are huge homes that he rents as Airbnbs. The neighborhood has never been behind the complete project, as I understand Mr. Roby stated in the last meeting in front of city council. Our concerns are, where will visitors to the owners of the condos park? Both Holly and Oxley Road are barely can barely accommodate parking for the homes there as it is. Where is the green space? Fifth by Northwest has this as a requirement for building, but it was cast aside when they approved these plans. What about garbage pickup? The alley on the south side that separates Grandview from Columbus will not be able to have a Columbus City garbage truck fit along with the huge green garbage cans that Columbus uses. What if there's a fire? This is our biggest concern. What if there's a fire? If you could see how, how dense that property is, how does a fire truck get in there to provide services? It will not fit behind the alley either. It would be along Third Avenue for those, but what about the other residences that are on the south side? I would like to strongly suggest to anyone who's involved in the process of approving these building plans, please visit the site. You will be able to see from the neighborhood perspective how ominous, overwhelming, and crowded the site will be. And as I wanted to uh, follow up on what Mr. McKinnis had, it's like, you know, it's very tall. Why not reduce the height and provide a basement? It's close to the property line. Why not reduce the units down from 3,000 square feet per unit? I think that's what that means, SF. <laughs> the, the surround neighborhood is on average 1,200 to 1,500 square feet per single family home. And it's too dense. Why not reduce the number of units as I already suggested? 
Thank you, Ms. Perkins. Do one of my colleagues have any questions for Ms. Perkins at this time? Um, Ms. Perkins, did you attend the Area Commission meeting that this was voted on? No. Okay, thank you. Were you aware? Yes. Any I other? wrote a letter at that time, too. I couldn't make it. I was in the Grand Caymans. Okay. Any other questions for Ms. Perkins? Thank you very much. At this time, I would invite uh, Mr. Dave Perry, the um, attorney for the applicant, to come forth for... Welcome back to council, Mr. Perry. Allow me to correct the record. Mr. Perry is appearing as an agent for the Thank applicant, you, not the attorney. Right. Um, uh, Mr. Perry, let me swear you in real quick. Raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give shall be the truth and not the the truth as you shall answer in a pains or penalty of perjury? If so, please say I do. I do. Floor is yours, sir. Members of council, you'll note that um, this application comes to you with city staff recommendation for approval, um, area commission recommendation for approval, development commission recommendation for approval. And I'd like to read, uh, I'd I want to give you a little history, but also I'd like to read, read the area commission response other than their vote, which has already been noted. The chair of the Area Commission noted on the response form, Commission finds variances reasonable, taking into account vocal citizen input of, of Grandview Heights residents, especially resistance to setback on the alley side of property. There was a, a lengthy discussion of the project and, and the variances, and the Commission vote was for approval, but um, it is significant that the chair wrote on the comment form, Commission finds variances reasonable. In um, prior to about August of 2022, uh, this was a different project. It included the whole block from Holly to Oxley. The uh, east end of the site adjacent to Holly is developed uh, with the uh, former AAA building and the rest of the block an outside storage yard. It has a chain link fence around it. Um, I, I believe there's barbed wire on some of the outside storage. So um, the development proposal that uh, I initially submitted an application for for Mr. Roby was the whole block, and then he decided to keep the AAA building, remodel it, expand it, uh, and so on for his um, company offices. The 5th by Northwest plan recommends uh, redevelopment of West Third with multifamily and office uses. We're hitting we're hitting both buttons on this with the plan with the office and and the multifamily. The office, given the M zoning, did not require um, rezoning or variances, and that um, that remodeling is probably done by now, or if not, will be shortly. So when the project changed and part of the block dropped out of the development, um, I redrafted the application for Mr. Roby and uh, Rob McGinnis and I know each other from other development business. Um, he's an architect with Ford Architecture and um, I've done business from time to time uh, with Ford Architecture. So um, I knew there were concerns about the previous proposal. I reached out to Rob to say, let's meet with the, the neighbors to the south, again, again Grandview Heights, and he he welcomed, welcomed the um, welcome reaching out and so on. And in, in August, uh, September of 2022, we met at the site. And then there's been additional correspondence with, uh, with Rob since then. At the, um, I, I don't recall it being, um, uh, we have different recollections of arranging that meeting versus um, Ms. Perkins. I don't recall it being postponed numerous times or difficult to meet. Uh, Mr. Roby, the project architect, Carrick Sherrill, and I met with uh, uh, neighbors at the site for about an hour and a half on, a, on an evening in September. Here are the things, the primary things that came out of that meeting. Reduced height on the south building, rec residents requested no height variance on the south building, and this was in particular their primary request. 
um, eliminate the decks facing south towards Grandview Heights, and uh, could we make architectural design changes to the south building to reduce the mass, and that was done. Those items were all done. This, um, in time, we moved on to the, to the Area Commission. The result of that was, as, as I stated, the Commission did not find either the development or the variances to be objectionable. Uh, the Development Commission vote was for approval. The planning staff has found this project to be um, in compliance with the 5th by Northwest plan. So we are here before you tonight. And with that, um, I request your approval. We have also, um, uh, one other thing, we have also done the city's preliminary engineering process called Preliminary Site Compliance Plan. It's a technical review of many of the city offices. and. Um, there were, there were minor items, as is typically the case, but there was no objection from the fire department. So. Thank you, Mr. Perry. Do any of my colleagues have any questions for Mr. Perry at this time? Councilman Remy. Um, Mr. Perry, the, I'm just trying to, all I have is just a schematic, not really. On, on the, um, got to find it again. The parking situation, do they have garages underneath the townhomes? And then I saw the 20-foot asphalt um, down the middle of it. Is that, will there be parking there? It's not obviously wide enough, but. Uh, there, will, there is an internal driveway accessing the attached garages of each unit. That, that driveway is 20 feet wide. There will not be parking on that driveway, but parking, parking fully meets code requirement. And um, it's accessed on that internal driveway. Okay, and that's uh, two car garages for each unit? Yes. Or, okay. And then um, just tell me how refuse is going to be handled in that complex. This is, for, for refuse purposes, this is considered multifamily, right. under the, the refuse code. And so there are two options. You design refuse to meet city pickup standards with a dumpster and bulk pad and so on, or you use private hauler, and this would use private hauler. Each, each resident will have a 90-gallon can for their garage, and an entity other than the city will pick it up. Okay, thank you. Any other council member? Thank you, Mr. Perry. Yep, thank you. Um, so, Mr. Dietrich, I just wanted to underscore, so, because, uh, again, one of the speakers talked specifically around concerns around fire access. So, again, that is one of the approvals that come through this process is that our Division of Fire uh, reviews projects and signs off. Is that correct? They're typically part of the site compliance review, which typically occurs after zoning is approved. Okay. Um, excuse me. The site compliance review that Mr. Perry was <clears throat> referencing, the fire department um, is part of that review, and they are typically done after zoning is completed. Okay. Mr. Perry. Um, briefly, I can, I can add to that. Um, Mr. Dietrich may not have been... Um, intimately involved with our preliminary site compliance plan review, but um, but at the end of the day, the fire department is is part of the building permit review process, site compliance plan and building permit review process. So we believe this complies, but if we're wrong, Mr. Roby doesn't get a building permit. Yep. It's as simple as that. Great. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Perry. Any other questions by council members for the department? Thank you. Um, appreciate the public comment here tonight. Uh, as Mr. Perry shared, portions of this project were changed based upon neighborhood feedback. This has had full approvals from all approving bodies at this point. Again, the issues that I think were brought up have been part of the staff review of this project. Um, so therefore, uh, I'm comfortable with moving forward. So first I move to accept the entire staff report into evidence as an exhibit. Clerk, please call the roll. Barbosa de Padilla, Doran's favor, Remy President Harden. Accepted. Next, move to adopt the findings of staff as the findings of council. Clerk, please call the roll. Barbosa de Padilla, Doran's favor, Remy President Harden. Adopted. And finally, move for passage. Clerk, please call the roll. Barbosa de Padilla, Doran's favor, Remy President Harden. Passed. Thank you. 
Next, we have Ordinance 0884-2023 to grant appearance provisions of Section 3332.035, R3 Residential District 3332.05A4, Area District Lot with Requirements 3332.13, R3 Area District Requirements, the Columbus City Codes are properly located at 1375 23rd Avenue to permit a two-unit dwelling with reduced development standards in the R3 Residential District. The applicant is uh, Healthy Linden Homes, care of Emily Long Rayford. Uh, the proposed use of two-unit dwelling, sees front recommendation is approval. South London Air Commission's recommendation is also approval. First move to accept the entire staff report and new evidence as an exhibit. Second, let's call the roll. Barossa de Padilla, Doran's favor, Remy President Harden. Accept it. Next, I move to adopt the fines of staff as the fines of council. Second, let's call the roll. Barossa de Padilla, Doran's favor, Remy uh, President Harden. Uh, uh, second, yep. Uh, and next, I move for passage. Clark, please call the row. For us favor, Ramey, President Harden. Pass. Next, we have Ordinance 0885 2023 <laughs> to grant advance provisions of Section 3332.035, R3 Residential District 3312.49, MIM number of parking spaces required of the Columbus City Codes, the property located at 1278 East, 9th, uh, East 19th Avenue to permit a two unit dwelling for the reduced development standards in the R3 Residential District. The applicant is Healthy Linden Homes, care of Emily Long Rayford, proposed use of a two unit dwelling, stays Department recommendation is approval. South London Air Commission recommendation is also approval. I first move to accept the entire staff report and new evidence as an exhibit. Clerk, please call the row. Barbosa de Padilla, Doran's favor, Remy President Harden. Accept it. Next, I move to adopt the fines of staff, the fines of council. Clerk, please call the row. Barbosa de Padilla, Doran's favor, Remy President Harden. Adopt it. Finally, I move for passage. Clerk, please call the row. Barbosa de Padilla, Doran's favor, Remy President Harden. Pass. Next, I, we have or ordinance 0886-2023 to grant advance provisions of section 3332.035, R3 Residential District 3332.05, A4 Area District Lot with Requirements, 3332.13, R3 Area District District Requirements, and 3312.49, minimum number of parking space required. The Columbus City Goes are properly located at 1333-1335 uh, East 18th Avenue to permit a two-unit dwelling for reduced development standards in the R. R3 residential district. The applicant is a healthy Linden Homes, care of Emily Long Rayford, proposed use of a two unit dwelling. Police Department re recommendation is approval. South Linden Air Commission's recommendation is also approval. I first move to accept the entire staff report and do evidence as an exhibit. Clerk, please call the roll. Provosa de Padilla, Doran's favor, Remy President Harden. Accept it. I next move to adopt the fines of staff, the fines of council. Second. Clerk, please call the roll. Provosa de Padilla, Doran's favor, Remy President Harden. Adopt it. Ne next, I move for passage. Clerk, please call the roll. Barossa de Padilla, Doran's favor, Remy President Harden. Pass. Thank you. We have next we have ordinance 0888 2023 to grant advance provisions of sections 3332.035 R3 Residential District 3332.05 A4 Area District Lot with requirements and 3332.13 R3 Area District Requirements of Columbus City Codes so properly located at 1085-1087 East 18th Avenue permit a two-unit dwelling with reduced development standards in the R3 Residential District. The applicant is healthy linded homes, care of Emily. Long Rayford proposed use two unit dwelling. City's department recommendation is approval. South Linden Air Commission's recommendation is also approval. I first move to accept the entire staff report and do evidence as an exhibit. Clerk, please call the roll. Provost de Padilla, Doran's favor, Remy President Harden. Clerk, please call the roll. Uh, accept it. I next move to adopt the fines of staff, the fines of council. Clerk, please call the roll. Provost de Padilla, Doran's favor, Remy President Harden. Adopt it. And finally, move for passage. Clark, please call the row. Provosa de Padilla, Doran's favor, Remy President Harden. A passed. Thank you. Next, we have ordinance 099, or I'm sorry, 0900-2023, granted variance provisions of section 3332.035, R3 Residential District, 3332.05, A4 Area District Lot with requirements, 3332.13, R3 Area District, District Requirements of Columbus City Codes for the property located at 1535. Um, 25th Avenue, permit a two-unit dwelling with reduced development standards in the R3 Residential District. The applicant is Healthy Linden Homes, care of Emily Long Rafer, proposed use of a two-unit dwelling. C City's Department recommendation is approval. South Linden Air Commission recommendation is also approval. Uh, we do have a speaker slip this evening uh, to speak against this ordinance. So therefore, we will have a staff presentation. Mr. Dietrich. The site consists of one undeveloped parcel in the R3 Residential District. The requested council variance will permit a two-unit dwelling to be constructed on the site. A council variance is required because the R3 District permits only single-unit dwellings. Variances to reduce the lot width and lot area are included with the request. 
The site is within the boundaries of the South London Land Use Plan, which recommends medium density residential land uses at this location, which is consistent with the proposal. Columbus City wide policy design guidelines recommend that the design and character of new development, including homes, additions, and garages, be appropriate and reflect the nearby structures in terms of height, width, setback, lot coverage, and roof pitch. The guidelines also call for, call for front porches, parking located to the rear, open space, street trees, and landscaping. Staff finds that the proposal is consistent with the plan's land use recommendations, C2P2 design guidelines, and development pattern in this neighborhood. As the proposal fits within the larger development pattern of this neighborhood, the request does not introduce an incompatible use to the area, and city departments recommend approval. Thank you. I um, want to invite Ms. Dawn um, Brown to the podium. Ms. Brown? Ms. Brown, welcome to council. If you could uh, raise your right hand. Um, do you swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give shall be the truth and nothing but the truth as you shall answer the pains or penalty of perjury? If so, please say I do. I do. Thank you. Floor is yours, ma'am. I am opposing the um, project that is uh, by way of the nationwide children's program. I didn't grasp everything, but I'm opposing it because it does change the... Uh, community in which I've been part of since the mid-60s. It changes things. Um, I listened to one other speaker mention uh, the affordable housing for families that make $30,000-ish uh, so that they can afford housing. What I'm looking at as a person who is a veteran of this community what I am looking at is sometimes we have different values. And just because the housing is affordable doesn't mean that, those, that, that uh, affordable housing makes good neighbors because the values are different. So if this person over here is getting up going to work every day working two jobs, they want to go to bed at night. They don't want to hear your kids. They don't want to see all those toys all over the place, chalk all in the street. They don't want to see that. I know I don't, and I'm tired of it. Uh, and then you have the, the parents or the guardians of this mindset. They're not going to bed. They're having people come over with loud music all in the middle of the night. This is a community. So I say this, 43211 has definitely changed since the 60s. Uh, when my father bought this house, we were in company of the Roebuck, as in Sears and Roebuck. Uh, it has changed. I get that part. But just accepting programs at a place, this is not doing anything for our, um, I'm, I can't think of the term right now, but this, this is a, an old neighborhood that deserves to be revamped. We deserve uh, respect in our neighborhoods. So I say move some of these programs to zip code 43085. M move them to Muirfield. Let's try some of that. Everything, every experience doesn't have to be with the Linden area. And also one of my concerns is if this is some program for nationwide, it may be, I'm retired military, it may be funded for under this Linden Home Healthy program for a little while, but I see it as an extension of downtown and as an extension of Nationwide Children's Hospital as possibly being in the future a campus where their doctors can be, a complete community to upgrade the hospital, which is fine, but don't put us out. Don't put us out. And I listened to another speaker or, or someone about the parking in the back that was approved, the city of Columbus is actually fining people for parking in the back over there. So why is it okay under a program, but it's not okay for people who's been there since the 60s? Get it together. One accord. Do any of my colleagues have any questions or comments for Ms. Brown? Oh. Council Member Favor. 
So um, just, a, just a question of whether you're familiar with the Healthy Homes Initiative on the south side. No, ma'am, I am not. I'm okay. just learning about this today. Okay, wonderful. It's, it's actually a really great initiative that um, Nationwide, in partnership with Healthy Homes, um, embarked on to address the blight that was uh, has occurred on the south side uh, and put those properties back into good use. Uh, by making them affordable. And I think sometimes the word affordable uh, gets a really bad rep because we think of folks who might not be working, but they're, they average on medium, targeting around the 60% to 80% of the area median income, which is really around that 60,000-ish range uh, when we're talking about families. Uh, so it's working individuals uh, that, that are you know working in the hospitals or they might be teaching in our classrooms. Um, but it 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 has been a proven model that has worked uh, fairly well on the south side, and I think that um, as we've been talking about different programs and uh, other affordable housing initiatives, I just wanted to share just that little bit of information about what's happened on the south side too. And thank I, I, you for your advocacy and, and being here this evening. Absolutely. Um, if, if we're if we're if we're talking about the average income, forty, fifty, sixty thousand dollars a year they don't need a program they just need to work on their credit honey they don't need a program uh, any other questions or comments from Ms. Brown thank you, for your service. thank you yeah, yeah thank you thank you for being here tonight thank you um I have nothing else what's that I have nothing else yep. am I free to go yep you are yes. thank you for being here um Miss uh, Emily Rayfield is from um, the pro from Healthy Linden Homes is also here. I want to pause? If do any of my colleagues have any questions for, for Miss Rayfield? Seeing none, I think we're probably good to, to move on at this point. So, Miss Rayfield, thank for thank you for making yourself available. Um, as we've talked about, what this program does is really bring workforce affordable housing into neighborhoods that are in desperate need of it. I appreciate Ms. Brown for being here this evening. Um, but this program has proven um, to be a real value add for many families in Columbus already. And the variances that are being requested here tonight seem appropriate to allow this to move forward. So at this time, I move to accept the entire staff report into evidence as an exhibit. Second. Clerk, please call the roll. For Rosa De Padilla, Doran's favor, Remy President Harden. Accept it. I next move to adopt the findings of staff and the findings of council. Clerk, please call the roll. Barossa de Padilla, Doran's favor, Remy President Harden. Adopt it. And finally, I move for passage. Clerk, please call the roll. Barossa de Padilla, Doran's favor, Remy President Harden. Passed. Thank you. Next, we have Ordinance 0902 2023 to grant advance provisions of Section 3332.035 R3 Residential District 3332.05 A4 Area District Lot with requirements for. Uh, 3332.13 R3 area district requirements 3312.49 MIM number of parking space required for the Columbus of the Columbus City Code. So, property located at 12921294 East 18th Avenue, permitted two unit dwelling, reduced development standards in the R3 residential district. The applicant is Healthy Linden Homes, care of Emily Long Rayford. Uh, the proposed use of a two unit dwelling, city's part recommendation is approval, South and Linden Area Commission's recommendation is also approval. I first move to accept the entire staff report and do evidence as an exhibit. Barbosa de Padilla, Doran's favor, Remy President Harden. Thank you. Next move to adopt the finance of staff as the finance of council. Barbosa de Padilla, Doran's favor, Remy President Harden. Next move to amend as submitted to the clerk. Barbosa de Padilla, Doran's favor, Remy President Harden. Finally, I move for passage. Barossa de Padilla, Doran's favor, Remy President Harden. Thank you. Next, we have Ordinance 0925-2023 to grant advance provisions of Section 3332.035 R3 Residential District 3332.05A4 Area District Lot with Requirements 3332.13 R3 Area District Requirements and 3312.49 Minimum Number of Parking Space Required for the Columbus City Coast, the property located at 1249 East 16th Avenue to prevent a two-unit dwelling with reduced development standards in the R3 Residential District. The applicant is Healthy Linden Homes, care of Emily Long Rayfield. Proposed use of a two-unit dwelling city department recommendation is approval. South Linden Air Commission's recommendation is also approval. I first move to accept the entire staff report into evidence as an exhibit. Barbosa de Padilla, Doran's favor, Remy President Harden. Accept it. I next move to adopt the finance of staff as the finance of council. Clerk, please call the roll. Barbosa de Padilla, Doran's favor, Remy President Harden. 
Adopt it. And finally, move for passage. Clerk, please call the roll. Provost de Padilla, Dorrance, favor, Remy, President Harden. Pass. Thank you. Next, we have Ordinance 0926 2023 to grant appearance provisions of Section 3332.035 R3 Residential District 3332.05 A4 Area District Lot Width Requirements 3332.13 R3 Area District Requirements and 3312.49 Minimum Number of Parking Spaces Required for the Columbus City Coast are properly located at 1550 26th Avenue to permit a two unit dwelling with reduced development standards in the R3 Residential District. The applicant is Healthy Linden Homes, care of Emily Long Rayfield. Proposed use is a two unit dwelling. City's Department recommendation is approval. South Linden Area Commission's recommendation is also approval. I first move to accept the entire staff report into evidence as an exhibit. Barossa de Padilla, Dorrance Favor, Remy President Harden. Next move to adopt the finance of staff as the finance of council. Provosa de Padilla, Dorrance Favor, Remy President Harden. And finally, move for passage. Provosa de Padilla, Dorrance Favor, Remy President Harden. Pass. Thank you. Next, we have Ordinance 0927-2023 to grant advance provisions of Section 3332.035 R3 Residential District 3322.05 A4 Area District Lot with Requirements 3332.13 R3 Area District Requirements of the Columbus City Code. So, properly located at 1457 24th Avenue to permit a two unit dwelling with reduced development standards in the R3 Residential District. The applicant is Healthy Linden Homes, care of Emily Long Rayfield. Proposed use of two unit dwelling, State Department recommendations approval. South Linden Area Commission's recommendations also approval. Uh, I move to accept the entire staff report into evidence as an exhibit. Barossa de Padilla, Dorrance Favor, Remy President Harden. Next move to adopt the finance of staff as the finance of council. Barossa de Padilla, Dorrance Favor, Remy President Harden. Finally, I move for passage. Barossa de Padilla, Dorrance Favor, Remy President Harden. Thank you. Next, we have variance uh, 0929 2023 to grant advance provisions of section 3332.039 R4 Residential District 3312.49 MIM number of parking spaces acquired 3332.05 A4 Area District Lot Width Requirements 3332.15 R4 Area District Requirements 3332.19 Fronting 3332.26 C1 Minimum Side Yard Permitted and 333 2.27 rear yard of the Columbus City Code, so property located at 317 Tappan Street to permit a two single unit dwelling on one lot with reduced development standards in the R4 residential district. The applicant is Julie, uh, Juliet Bullock, architect. Proposed use is a two unit dwelling on one lot. City's Department recommendation is approval. The Victorian Village uh, Commission's recommendation is also approval 7 0. We have two public speakers to see to speak against this project this evening. So we will now have a staff presentation. Mr. Dietrich, floor is yours. The site consists of one parcel in the R4 residential district developed with a single unit dwelling. The requested council variance will permit a single unit dwelling above a rear detached garage. A council variance is necessary because the R4 district permits up to four units in one building, but does not permit two single unit dwellings on one lot. The request includes variances to lot width, lot area, fronting, side and rear yards, and a parking space reduction from four required to two provided parking spaces. The site is located within the boundaries of the Victorian Village Commission, which does not include a land use recommendation, but will require a certificate of appropriateness for the final design of the proposed carriage house. Staff supports the requested use and variances as the proposal preserves the original contributing structure is located within a walkable neighborhood and is consistent with similar requests in the area and therefore we recommend approval. Thank you, Mr. Dietrich. Um, the first speaker we have to speak on this ordinance is Mr. Jeff Long. Mr. Long. Welcome to council, Mr. Long. If you wouldn't mind raising your right hand to be sworn in, sir. Do you swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give shall be the truth and nothing but the truth as you shall answer to pains or penalty of perjury? If so, please say I do. I do. Mr. Long, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak to this issue this evening. Um, I've lived on the street since the early 70s, was involved in the R4 rezoning effort during that period, also the historic district, and sat on the Victorian Village Commission for a number of years. I object to this variance for several reasons. Number one, there is no historical basis for this building to be put on this alley. Number two, the zoning is inappropriate. R4 requires 2,400 square feet per unit. 
This lot is only 3,000 square feet. Now, for those of you who weren't here in the 70s, this area was a very dilapidated, torn area. A large part of the problem in Victorian Village at that time was density. We had too many people, too many units, a large number of absentee owners, including those who owned absentee single families. Shortly after I got there, the Department of Development and the Society together decided that the way to correct the problem was to reduce density. And in regard to that, we began working on the R4 project at that point to blanket rezone the entire area west of Neal, south of First Avenue. The area to the east is zoned ARLD, which is a compatible zoning pattern. The idea was to reduce density and encourage single family owner occupied properties. And that was passed by council, supported by the Department of Development during that period of time. The success of the program, I think, is apparent at this point. Victorian Village is quite successful now, is essentially an owner-occupied single-family area, very valuable in that respect. In addition to the R4 rezoning at that point, to give the commission additional leverage, we did the historic district, again to protect the properties and again to reduce density. And the commission was formed to guide that development in the area. The proof of all these efforts for the last 50 years is there today in the value of these properties and in the community itself. The third point I want to make is what concerns me more than anything else than the increased density is the precedent or setting. If this is passed, then other people will attempt to increase density as well. This lot does not have the square footage necessary to support two units. Who is to say that the man with 3,200 square feet, 3,400 square feet, is any less able to increase density on his property? The other problem, of course, is absentee ownership. That has been a problem over the years. And one of the things we moved toward was to reduce the absentee ownership in the area. And that, again, has been very successful. I think to jettison the R4 program, which is what this does, it opens the door to more and increased dense usage. To jettison the R4, which has been very good for us, is a mistake because it allows the possibility that others will come in to increase density on their lots too, and some more justifiable than 3,000 square feet. The precedent is important because lacking the necessary footage, we need to keep density low there to retain value and the strength of the community. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Long. Do I my colleagues have any questions for Mr. Long at this time? Thank you. Um, the next speaker to sign up before council is Mr. Justin Furman. Mr. Furman, welcome to council. Would mind raising your right hand and I will swear you in, sir. Mm -hmm. uh, do you swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give shall be the truth and nothing but the truth as you shall answer to pain or penalty of perjury? If so, please say I do. I do. The floor is yours, sir. Thank you. Um, I just would like to speak to kind of the usage of the property now. Um, the property now is being used as an Airbnb, and with this extra dwelling, I, I think it's safe to assume that it would be used as an Airbnb as well. So, you know, I'm, I'm not opposed to the, you know, the, the, the current um, Airbnb there or a garage or if the resident, you know, would put that in. But it just seems like putting another unit in to be another Airbnb is just kind of, uh, kind of a, a, you know, not what the variance, or excuse me, not what the zoning of the of the uh, neighborhood is, you know, you know, for, and it just seems like it would be kind of a backdoor um, a commercialization of the property, if you will, from you know, taking it from a residential, 
And it just, just seems a bit excessive, and I just kind of oppose that. I mean, it, as I think a lot of their neighbors do, in which they signed a petition, um, which Mr. Long uh, did, did uh, go around the neighborhood and get uh, quite a few signatures on, which I appreciate his efforts on that. And um, just kind of in closing, I'd just like to say, um, as far as the Historical Commission, I did not receive any notice from them. I'm not actually sure um, how they uh, notify residents of anything. I didn't get any letters um, of that. So we, it was kind of kind of surprised that you know it came up with the Historical uh, Commission. Otherwise, we would have you know gone before that body as well and, and uh, opposed this uh, this variance. So, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Firm. Do my colleagues have any questions for Mr. Furman at this time? Seeing none, thank you. Thank you. Um, next, I'll allow the applicant's agent to speak to the, this project, um, Ms. Julia Bullock. Welcome back to council. Mind raising your right hand and I will swear you in. Do you swear from the testimony you're about to give shall be the truth, nothing but the truth, as you shall answer pains or penalty of perjury? If so, please say I do. I do. The floor is yours. Okay. Um, my name is Julie Bullock and I'm the architect on the property. So I've been working with the homeowner to develop to develop this accessory unit. Um, their plan is to use it for personal use um, and as a home office on occasion. Both of their parents are out of town. And they also work downtown and they have a residence in Delaware. So this is kind of a stopping point for them. So that's the intention. Um, this is a very diverse part of Victorian Village. Um, I drove through the neighborhood this weekend and there are within the two blocks that this is located, including the block to the south, we have multifamily residential, apartment buildings, duplexes, single family, and even a fairly new carriage house that is just four units down. So certainly the precedent has already been set for carriage houses in this area. Um, Victorian village homes date back to the 1880s have commonly included carriage houses options. Very few, if any of the homes in the neighborhood meet the requirements of the R4 district as it stands right now, just simply because it's an urban neighborhood, you know, lot size, lot coverage, et cetera. So I think that's why we have this process <laughs> because you know the houses don't meet the requirements. And whenever we, um, provide or propose something new, we, we also retroactively um, ask for variances on the existing house as well. So that's included in this variances. Um, I think the variance requests are actually fairly minimal. Um, our lot coverage is um, 1,337 square feet, which is 40% of the actual lot area. When I'm looking at these projects for my client, you know, the city of Columbus says 50% is a reasonable development cover. Um, and so we're well below that. So I feel like the lot coverage is reasonable for our request. Um, I think these um, carriage houses are a great solution for urban neighborhoods and historic neighborhoods. They allow you to maintain the integrity of the existing historic home, main view, maintain views to the backyard for the original home while still allowing the homeowners to add to the property. By combining the parking and the space above, it also maintains green space. I truly believe that this is the best solution for historic properties such as these. Um, Victorian Village is a great urban neighborhood and as such, the values of the homes have skyrocketed. Allowing these types of units provides a more cost-effective housing unit and allows homeowners who might not otherwise be able to afford taxes and upgrade their homes to do so. We need housing in Columbus. We need cost-effective housing in Columbus. And these type of units working within the existing neighborhood context are a great solution to this issue. Victorian Village heard these arguments at their meeting. It was also posted, you know, the City of Columbus now requires us to put a sign in the yard. Um, and they still voted seven to zero to approve it. Um, I trust their viewpoint. I think they're good stewards of the neighborhood and the commission understands they don't just rubber stamp carriage houses, they look at the context. And I think when they looked at the context of this neighborhood, there was a lot of discussion. The fact that there are already carriage houses, that there's an apartment building on this alley down on the corner is the reason that they approved it unanimously. Thank you. Do any of my colleagues have any questions uh, at this time? Just Councilmember Favor. 
so much a question, just a remark, just in general, not even directed towards you. But I, I would say that just to acknowledge that um, City Council did roll out its uh, housing initiatives that it will prioritize for 2023. Part of that is uh, the rollout of um, an accessory dwelling unit pilot initiative, uh, which does seek to provide additional um, housing units in the city of Columbus. We have uh, significantly been underbuilding uh, for many years, and this is a response to providing a different type of product um, in the housing market uh, for residents in the city of Columbus. Um, so, you know, that will be one of the reasons why I will be supportive of this legislation this evening. I do appreciate the two uh, gentlemen that did provide uh, their feedback uh, this evening, but as we really do uh, look to tackle this housing crisis, um, in many different ways, we do have to think outside of the box about how we could um, address these issues. Thank you, uh, Thank you, Chair. Any other comments or questions from council members? Thank you, Ms. Bullock. Thank you. Um, again, want to thank the folks that came down this evening. It's rare to have someone who's intimately involved going back 40 plus years in, in zoning matters in the city to come before us to share that. I think that historical context. I think um, what maybe was true in the 1970s that I think dovetails right into Councilmember Favor's point of we talk a lot about density around council right now because density means the ability to produce more units within areas that are connected to transit, connected to job centers, connect you know right outside downtown. And um, of the nine uh, priorities that council articulated when it looked at uh, when I took over the zoning committee, one of them was appropriate density within neighborhoods, especially if it's connected to, to transit and job opportunities nearby. This project checks those boxes. Um, it's been approved by city staff, Victorian Village Commission, which um, you know, provides additional scrutiny on many projects that com comes through past at 7-0. Uh, therefore, I feel comfortable uh, supporting this ordinance and therefore first move to accept the entire staff report into evidence as an exhibit. Second. Barbosa de Padilla, Doran's favor, Remy, President Harden. Second. Next, I move to adopt the findings of staff, the findings of council. Provosa de Padilla, Doran's favor, Remy, President Harden. And finally, move for passage. Provosa de Padilla, Doran's favor, Remy, President Harden. And finally, in the zoning committee, we have ordinance 0741 2023 to grant advanced provisions of section 3333.18 building lines of the Columbus City Coast of property located at 2870 Allen Creek Drive to permit a Reduced, reduced building line in AR-12 apartment residential district for multi-unit residential development. The applicant is home port care of uh, Laura Comeck attorney proposed use a multi-unit residential development. Seeds department recommendation is approval. Far South, Far South Area Commission recommendation is also approval. 9L. I first move to accept the entire step report to do evidence as an exhibit. Provosa de Padilla, Dorn's favor, Remy President Harden. Second. Next move to adopt the finance of staff, the finance of council. Provosa de Padilla, Doran's, Remy, Doran's favor, Remy President Harden. Next move to amend estimate of the clerk. Provosa de Padilla, Doran's favor, Remy President Harden. And finally, move for passage. Provosa de Padilla, Doran's favor, Remy President Harden. Thank you, Council President. That's all we have in the zoning agenda tonight. The zoning committee is in motion to adjourn. Is there a second? Clerk, please call the roll. Provosa de Padilla, Doran's favor, Remy President Harden. Meeting is adjourned.
Dorn's favor, Remy President Harden. Meeting number 16 is reconvened. We are in the Finance Committee, and I chair the Finance Committee. Tonight in Finance, we have a total of 14 ordinances. The first is 0786-2023, is to authorize the Director of the Department of Finance and Management to enter into contract with the Greater Columbus Arts Council, Inc., for the purposes of fostering and sustaining arts and cultural services that enrich the Columbus community, and to authorize the expenditure of $7,924,000 from the Hotel Motel Excise Tax Fund in accordance with Sections 371 0.02 of the Columbus City Code and to declare an emergency. A portion of all the funds from Hotel and Motel stays in the City of Columbus and are set aside for cultural programming and supporting artists. These funds will help support local artists and engaging programs that enrich our community and keep Columbus a top cultural destination. Do any of my colleagues have any questions or comments? Say none, I move for passage. Clerk, please call the roll. Banks, Tim Barosa de Padilla, Dorn's favor, Remy President Harden. Pass. The remaining 13 ordinances are um, all authorize various city departments to issue bond sales. This is an important funding tool that allows us to invest in major projects. I'm going to turn the floor over to the finance team. Um, I see Chris is here to talk a bit about the bond process and what these ordinances will do. Good evening, President Harden, President Pro Tem Dorans, members of council. Um, so tonight, uh, beginning with Ordinance 0889 through uh, Ordinance 0899, <clears throat> these all represent a series of ordinances which seek City Council approval to issue municipal bonds. These would provide funding for the 2022 Capital Improvement Budget, which was authorized and adopted by City Council last uh, summer. Uh, the ability to issue these municipal bonds will provide approximately $421 million of capital funding that the city can then use to implement capital improvement programs around such program areas as safety and health, affordable housing, public utility infrastructure projects, recreation and parks projects, as well as public service, including roadway improvements, uh, resurfacing and sidewalks. Um, related but slightly different, uh, President Harden, is ordinances 0907 and 0908. These two ordinances seek the ability to refund certain existing debt that the, the city currently holds. There are occasions where market conditions prove favorable for the city to essentially refinance existing debt at lower rates. So this just provides blanket authority for the city auditor uh, to move forward and, and the finance director in that capacity. Um, thank you for your consideration. Happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much, sir. I want to um, commend the finance team and the auditor's office for their tremendous work. Last week we talked about um, the city being uh, awarded again our AAA bond rating from Moody's. Um, and that's a recognition of our strong fiscal management. So just thank all of the folks from the auditor's office, from finance team, um, for allowing us to be here. And that allows us to sustainably invest in projects like those funded by the bonds up for authorization tonight. With that, I'm going to introduce the ordinances. Uh, first ordinance is 08. 89-2023 authorizing the issuance of unlimited tax bonds in the amount not to exceed $32,545,000 for health, safety, and infrastructure related projects to authorize the appropriation and expenditure of $4 million from the special income tax fund for cost of issuance and to declare an emergency. If there are no questions or comments, I move for passage. Clerk, please call the row. Banks, Timber, Rosa de Padilla, Doran's favor, Remy, President Harden. Passed. Next is Ordinance 0890-2023, authorizing the issuance of unlimited tax bonds in the amount not to exceed $66,240,000 for recreation and parks related projects and to declare an emergency. If there are no questions or comments, I move for passage. Please, clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Barossa de Padilla, Dorn's favor, Remy President Harden. Pass. Next ordinance is 0892-2023, authorizing the issuance of unlimited tax bonds in the amount not to exceed $123,585,000 for public service related projects and to declare an emergency. If there are no questions or comments, I move for passage. Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Barossa de Padilla, Dorn's favor, Remy President Harden. Pass. Next ordinance is 0893-2023, authorizing the issuance of unlimited tax bonds in an amount not to exceed $19,500,000 for neighborhood development related projects and to declare an emergency. If there are no questions or comments, I move for passage. Clerk, please call the roll. 
Bankston, Barossa de Padilla, Dorrance Favor, Remy, President Harden. Pass. Next ordinance is 0894-2023, authorizing the issuance of unlimited tax bonds in an amount not to exceed $102,305,000 for public utility-related projects and to declare an emergency. If there are no questions or comments, I move for passage. Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Barossa de Padilla, Dorrance Favor, Remy, President Harden. Next is Ordinance 0895-2023, authorizing the issuance of limited tax bonds in an amount of not to exceed $5 million for the Office of the City Auditor related projects and to declare an emergency. If there are no questions, I move for passage. Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Barossa de Padilla, Dorrance Favor, Remy, President Harden. Pass. Next, we have Ordinance 0896-2023, authorizing the issuance of limited tax bonds in an amount not to exceed $10,609. 90,000 for construction management related projects and to declare an emergency. If there are no questions or comments, I move for passage. Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Barossa de Padilla, Dorrance Favor, Remy, President Harden. Passed. Next is Ordinance 0897-2023, authorizing the issuance of limited tax bonds in an amount not to exceed $5,960,000 for information services related projects and to declare an emergency. If there are no questions or comments, I move for passage. Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Barbosa de Padilla, Dorrance Favor, Remy, President Harden. Pass. The next ordinance is 0898-2023, authorizing the issuance of unlimited tax bonds in an amount not to exceed $800,000 for fleet management related projects and to declare an emergency. Are there any questions or comments? Seeing none, I move for passage. Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Barbosa de Padilla, Dorrance Favor, Remy, President Harden. Next is Ordinance 0899-2023, authorizing the issuance of limited tax bonds in the amount not to exceed $54,425,000 for the economic community development related projects and to declare an emergency. Are there any questions or comments? Seeing none, I move for passage. Clerk, please call the row. Banks, Timber, Rosa de Padilla, Dorrance Favor, Remy, President Harden. Pass. Next is Ordinance 0907 2023, authorizing the issuance of unlimited tax general obligation bonds in one or more series in an amount not to exceed $350 million for the purpose of providing funds to refund certain outstanding general obligation bonds of the city and to declare an emergency. Are there any questions or comments? Seeing none, I move for passage. Clerk, please call the row. Banks, Timber, Rosa de Padilla, Dorrance Favor, Remy, President Harden. Uh, passed. Uh, finally, I have 0908-2023, authorizing the issuance of limited tax general obligation bonds in one or more series in an amount not to exceed $150 million for the purpose of providing funds to refund certain outstanding general obligation bonds of the city and to declare an emergency. Are there any questions or comments? Seeing none, I move for passage. Clerk, please call the roll. Thanks, Tim Barossa de Padilla, Dorn's favor, Remy President Harden. That concludes tonight's finance agenda meeting. Seeing no further business before council, I move to adjourn. Just, rem just a reminder, we do not have council next meet, so we will see you again on the 17th, I believe. Clerk, please call the roll. Thanks, Denver, Rosa de Padilla, Dorrance Favor, Remy, President Harden. We are adjourned. <laughs>